Right. So it's episode 18 of So Many Insight. My guest, my well, my host, as usual, Monte Cristo. What should I say about him this week? He's just, Voice a, coach just, a. just a guy who hosts with me. <laughs> he gets into I almost identical back and forths with Loco Doco, which I don't really understand because even if you're winning them, you like let Loco think that he wins them or something. And then at the end, you like congratulate him and tell him good luck or something. And then he's like, ah, beat him down again. <laughs> so Monte Cristo here. And I'm sure every TSM fan's like, ha, oh, Loco wrecked him there. Even though Loco's like, <laughs> We, Wilco's replies always involved talking about like expediating processes and shit, like stuff that I think he just like looked up the terminology of that day. So hello, Monty. You mean expatiating? Yeah. Because that's the word he that's actually That's the word uses, he always uses. It. Yeah. But that's not like, it's not, it's not, he doesn't know what the, no. that word means. <laughs> so how are you doing, Monty? How are you holding great. up there? I, I'm good. Okay. You haven't like uh, hit the bottle like Mithy. You haven't spiraled out of control. No, it's good. I'm in the CLG house in Seoul. Uh, oh, in Seoul. Oh, okay. The CLG has yeah. a house in Seoul. Okay, we'll get to that later in the show. Uh, our guest for this week. See, people told me, they didn't really, I don't listen to their people, but uh, hypothetically, people told me like, oh, it's not enough trash talk on that show. Like, people are just too, too straightforward with the answers. They're not very forthcoming. And so I thought to myself like, oh, well, what I'll do is, most pros are actually like that, you know, because they're not very confident and also, you know, they just play the game. They don't they do not do a lot of trash talking. So you actually have to like, they, you know, like double if they have to learn to develop that side of their persona. So I thought, right, what I'll do is I'll get the only pro who literally used to trash talk his own teammates in the game and then like rage quit his own games, not even solo queue, just actually rage quit his own scrims if like he died one extra time. Of course, his name was Gosu Pepper. And then what happened was, one night he was asleep and the reddit alien the riot aliens rather they lowered the tractor beam and they lifted him up and after the <laughs> after operating and probing different parts of him and removing vital organs like his spirit and his soul they brought back this guy called edward who all of a sudden magically then spoke english and was like really nice in the community he was like hello community i do streaming for you and i'm very polite now yes i think snoopy is a good player and i hope to play him again like what happened edward what happened to that guy gosu pepper i love that guy it was a secret. Why you told everyone that? Okay, so like, no one's supposed to know that. Yeah, so we're here with Edward. <laughs> Hello. Right, let's start the show. We'll just st we'll start the show. Obviously, with topics about Edward. We'll talk to Monty later on about CLG because like, I don't think that shit's going anywhere. So, like, we'll talk we'll talk to Edward now. <laughs> now, Edward, here's the problem. On one hand, it's great that you're on the show. On the other hand, the fact that you're on the show means you knocked the fuck out of LCS and you're not in the playoffs. So, let's just start right there, shall we? At the beginning well, of this I'm... season, you knew you were coming in, no Alex Hitch, and the original plan was, okay, we've got the same team, but we're just going to add in this guy, Neek, who've played in some Polish teams in the past. What were your initial expectations for what this season was going to be like for Gambit? What did you think? Well, when it was just, after Alex left, we just, uh, I think, made a Skype call as five, I mean, six people, and this group told us, like, uh, you guys ready? Like, it's gonna be hard times when we're gonna add the Nick in team. Actually, we didn't know the Nick is gonna be in team. We're still trying to find a new player. And we actually didn't find and a Nick, uh, he just typed it to our Facebook, I think. And we just tried him out and he was the best option to get in the team. I don't know, it was, everyone was really, um, not hyped, but everyone was ready to prove that we're even like, like we're still a good team, even without Alex, but I don't know, it just went super bad. But we'll see what, yeah, what okay, going to happen. When you later. say that, okay, we were a really good team. Like the initial scrims when you first picked him up, they were all going well. Every, every indication was that this was going to be a good team, right? Well, I, mm, Gambit knows like we always play scrims like super trolly, but even with Nick, we, we, went to, we just try hard, uh, I think, a lot like in the first weeks, I think. And we win a lot of games. And we came to first Super Week in the LCS. And we were just thinking we're gonna just 4-0 or something. But we got stumped like three games in a row, I think. And we won only one game against SK. Okay, wh what the fuck were you smoking that you thought you were gonna go 4-0 in the first Super Week? <laughs> you well, just said that in the scrims everyone was trolling or whatever, like, oh, we no, just- No, no, only okay. trolling it was like before, like, but, uh, and the, like first please and before the LCS starts we just try harding a lot 
the after just All Stars when Diamond came back from from friends. We're Monty, just a lot. When you first heard Gambit is going to Alex Hitch has left Gambit, but don't worry, never fear. They've recruited a guy you've never heard of who plays mid lane from Poland. You'd probably just go fine, right? Probably just fall zero mean, super week if anything, just to start things off the right way. I, I appreciate that level of confidence and optimism. I think you gotta have that going into a super week, but I would say that I would have been less than confident in those kind of results. I mean, I also don't pay, really pay attention to the challenger scene very much, so I had no idea who this guy was or how good he was or anything like that either. Okay. Mm. I like the way, just just because of the way you speak English, Edward, like you called him the Neek uh, instead of Neek, as though like you, it's like this mythical creature that you had to capture. <laughs> like, oh, we've lost the Alex Itch. Let, let's go to the, the southern realm the where neek. you find the Neek. And then you, you lured him in and then Groove ca caught him one of those Gambit-shaped Pokeballs. And then he brought him back to the Gambit owner, whoever that guy who sells like guns he, to like he North it. African no, they, they drug lords him. or something. They have to catch him in a Pringles can. That's the. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah, yeah. Well, if anything, I think that was the problem in Gambit, wasn't it? Once they popped, they couldn't stop. You know, those motherfuckers couldn't. Well, so, the, the problem was when we won in Spring Speed. Uh, we know we have to change something, like, and the, it happens that Alex left the team, and we knew like every any change was gonna like give give us something, even or just bad or just good. And uh, the screams uh, give, let us know that we actually can play good as a team. But and we actually started practice. I think like one week uh, before the every team started practice because of all stars. And I know people just relaxed it a lot. They didn't play much screams. We c couldn't even find like LCS teams to play. We only play challenger teams. I think so. That's why we told the super we're gonna be. When I did like, an interview with Alex after he just after he left, yeah, he told me. Because I, I sort of asked him, like, okay, everyone thinks of Alex Itch, he's the captain of Gambit, like, he's the emotional leader, all that stuff. And he told me, like, Alex Itch was the leader of Moscow 5, but he wasn't the leader of Gambit. And he made it sound like you were just, like, a band of just rebels. Like, you were all just alone, and you just came together, you played the matches, but then no one was the leader. No one got to tell everyone what to do, or tell this player, like, you're not doing it right. Was it, was it really like that, when Alex was there? Mm, depends what time. In... Let's in, say a month before he left. Month before he left? Uh, not really. We just, I think the month before he left, we it was times we played the for fifth place, right, against Copenhagen yeah. Wolves. They were actually working as a team a lot at the time, but after that, I don't know what happened. Shit Monty, happened. when you heard that Alexic was leaving. In a lot of teams, okay, even if you lose a better player and you get a player who's not as good or isn't as tenured, you could still make the team close to as good or you could make it a different style of a team. Not Do only a different style, but I think it can motivate the players to step up their game too. And, you know, sometimes it takes a, a large roster move like that in order for people to actually fix their attitudes or to rededicate themselves to the game or to uh, kind of not rest on their laurels, play a more laid-back style, and uh, kind of slip into a, a comfort rut. So there are positives to that kind of thing, for sure. Yeah, well, when exactly. You, well, when you heard they'd lost Alex, what was your initial impression? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was the same for me. When, when Alex left Edward, was there no... Was it really like... You all agreed, like, okay, we this is the way we have to go forward. Did he just break it out of nowhere, like, oh, I'm going to have to leave, guys? Well, he just, I think he, I just asked him to play a duo in, in the league. And he, he said, like, uh, I'm calling you in Skype. I just answered the Skype call, and he said, oh, well, I'm leaving. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And okay. It's like... That's pretty brutal. And right there. It was, like, a few days before... All stars, I think. You like invited him to a duo, and then he joined, and he had like the nip icon, and he was it was like nip <laughs> Alex Itch. You were like, what, what the fuck, bro? Aren't you in Gambit? It's like, yeah, about that, Edward. I've been meaning to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Okay. Oh yeah, go for it. Pretty... Well, to be fair, he should have took you with him. I think Nip needed a support player. It didn't didn't really work out with the one they had. Right. Okay. I have a question about Gambit then going forwards, because one of the problems in the Alex Itch era, okay, was you guys were doing. A, badly initially in that spring split and then you had that little run where you went to the top of the league actually and then at the end of the split okay obviously things went badly and the meta changed and you went in the playoffs and it wasn't very good 
But before the playoffs started, we heard all these stories in interviews with Gambit players saying, oh, we have an analyst now and he's going to be in our boot camp and we're going to listen to what he says. And it sounded like what every team says now when they have a bad period and they get an analyst. Like, oh, we're going to turn things around. Was that was things really going well when you first got that analyst? And you had that boot camp? Um, I don't think so. When we got the analyst, he didn't have any... He was never working with teams, I think. He, he just... He was just a random player, I think Diamond Friend, I guess. Yeah. And I was playing with him sometimes, like normal games and nothing else. And we, he actually came to, he was working in Germany, I think, in some random city. And okay. he came to watch LCS when it was in old ESL studio. Yeah, yeah. And, and then we just, I, I think we decided as a team, we need uh, another guy to work with us uh, to kind of control something in team. And But it's, I think it, it's, not gonna work out like instantly so it's he's he's much better now than before like i can say because that's the problem that's what i want to ask you about here when i hear that statement okay we've got an analyst and we're working with him he's going to be the boot camp i'm thinking like oh they've gone and they've got like some guy who's a real expert and he's going to tell them like what you expect now and that you know like here's the picks that you should do oh you're making mistakes here like do all this stuff but then the boot camp went you you had the bad playoff run this season <laughs> There was like a, an AMA with the analyst. I read all that and I was like, okay, yeah, this still all seems in line with what I was thinking. But then I saw an interview with the analyst on LCS and I was like, wait a minute, that can't be the analyst. That's the guy who used to just hang around with Gambit at the ESL studio. And then when I was like, who is that guy? They were like, oh, just a friend of ours. And then in the AMA, I was reading it and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm just a, like, what was it? Is he like diamond or platinum or something in the game? No, I think he's... Wood five. Gold, Where is he? Gold. Okay. No, almost. Yeah, yeah, I think he's gold. But okay, so he's he gold. Used, yeah. Yeah. When we used to play like a uh, spring split in 2013 and some tournaments like Kat Kat Katowice. Yeah. And he just uh, helped us with. He was doing some like, I don't know, just giving us inf information about different teams like from China, Korea. He just watched the their games and what are they playing and when they peak the uh, the things. But he didn't like anal analyze our games oh, yeah. and. Uh, okay, that's, like... that's what's confusing me here, Edward, is that it, it sounds like this guy wasn't an analyst, he was just a friend, and you needed an analyst, so you asked your friend, hey, can you do this? Is, it, is that really how it was? Like, put it this way, if he didn't come and be the analyst for Gambit now, would he be like an expert about League of Legends? Sorry, can you uh, repeat? The person who's the analyst right now, if he wasn't your analyst now, and you hadn't, you hadn't asked him to, would he still be watching games, and would he be an expert about League of Legends now? Hmm... I have no idea because I mean I, I don't I I don't really think that's like a relevant question because he's been giving. How is that not a relevant question? It made <laughs> Monty because... imagine CLD didn't have a coach okay, and then they say, "Oh, we really need a coach." And Doublelift's like, "Well, I do okay with a guy. We could ask him." He's like, "Well, is he an analyst?" <laughs> no, no, I just do okay with him. Well, how, how could he, how would he do the analysis then? Uh, just start, I guess. Just just try. And uh, no, but we need a real analyst who knows a lot about the game. Yeah, but as I said, he's my friend. Like, you see what I mean? Like, what that would be confusing as fuck, right? Well, I think that's actually how a lot of uh, these analysts and coaches do end up in in these positions. I mean, we've talked about like Dignitas and the Drunk Scar at Twitter account and Cumley and all of that stuff too. No, that's like, the opposite. They they got their position because they were already experts, and then the people knew and then hired them. You're talking about well, the other way around. That's like if they'd said, "Hey, we need an analyst." Uh, well, I don't know any. Do you know anyone who does any like parody accounts? We can maybe ask them to become an analyst. No, you already knew about the game, surely. Right, the problem for us was that we need to rush an analyst probably because Darren and Genzo doesn't speak like English at all pretty much and it's gonna be like super dumb to get an analyst who speak only English so we have to find like Russian one and I don't know the just our analyst is like very smart guy behind the League of Legends and he I think he know what's up to how to communicate with people okay. also so he I think he didn't force like analyzer games, but he also forced us to talk about game, like before or after. He's just forcing some stuff what we didn't do as much before. Also, Besides, you were friends with him in the first place because he did know a lot about the game and was helping you, right? You no, wouldn't have been just, friends with this guy. He just said they were just friends, though. Am I wrong here, Edward? He was just a friend of yours, right? He wasn't an expert, right? You just a guy you hung around with and he went to the LCS studios, right? Yeah, pretty much. That's what I mean. That's why it's a bizarre scenario, Monty. It's it's literally not like they found an analyst. It's like they just said, well, we need an analyst. Oh, this guy's here. I guess he could try it. Well, and, and then just hope it worked out. 
Until you don't try, you don't know how it's gonna work. Yeah, come on, I, you I, can't I just get my grandma I, to do it for you, can you? I, I would say that my situation was quite similar. I wasn't able to know, uh, you know, as much as I know about League right now until I got a job. You were a professional uh, shoutcaster already. But I wasn't anywhere near as knowledgeable as I am now before I was able to dedicate full time to it and, and live in Korea. Like, I was... Am I missing? Am I in like the Twilight Zone right now, Monty? As far as I can tell, your qualifications were already an expert, watched thousands of hours of League of Legends, have talked to players, is known for knowledge, on some level, maybe not as good now. Meanwhile, this guy's qualifications were capable of eating fries and drinking Coke with Edward in McDonald's. Like, am I missing something about how these two things don't equate? Am I wrong here, Edward? Is there some extra qualification he had? Oh, sorry, and can, can say Niet when they ask him if he wants... Uh, catch up on those fries if you could, if you said no in english then that wouldn't be good enough. you couldn't be an analyst i'm sorry you're not qualified anyway I yeah, continue okay continue to figure out because i don't really care what this guy's qualifications were what i care is if he's good at his job now yeah, with but I, the reason why i care though monty is because if they brought in the analyst and then they shit the bed harder than they ever have in a in a playoff of a big tournament i'm wondering what went on there did they actually well, listen it, to the analyst? Did they ignore him? Because it sounded from Alex's interview like they, they got the analyst and then he he sort of suggested as though no one even listened in the boot camp. You know, they just like, he told them stuff and they just didn't listen in the games. Am I wrong here, Edward? No, oh, actually, the, our analyst started, he, he become first manager. Then okay. we, for some reason, we thought we need some analyst and we just tried it to him, with him, and nothing else. So, that's um, it. What about in those playoffs? Because the playoffs was like, no one's ever seen Gambit play that bad in like a, a big impact game, okay? So was there was it to do with anything to do with the boot camp there? Like you didn't listen to the things he suggested or you had a different game plan and you didn't do it? What do you think? Uh, the problem at uh, before the playoffs, we actually doing was doing like super bad lane swaps. And I thought that Diamond and Darian didn't find the way... I mean, they didn't know what to do in lane swaps, but me and it was like super different. Me and Gengar was thinking one way, and Diamond and Darian was thinking another way, and we, like, it was super brutal to play with that. And we always do random shit, and I think we, when we came to playoffs, and we still didn't decide how to play that, and that's why we lost. Did you ever watch that series, Monty? Gam uh, Gambit versus Rockat? Yes, I don't remember it very well though. Because we were, I did remember, you actually think uh, Rockout was better than Gambit at the time? No, I mean we didn't think so either. I remember talking about it on the show, and yeah, yeah. we were quite surprised that Rockout had won that series. Yeah, you guys, I was watching this the show. You was talking that we're gonna win for sure, but yeah, yeah, we lost. yeah. Cheers, mate. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Why do you make us look bad? <laughs> <laughs> was there ever a possibility after that split that Gambit itself just either the whole lineup gets changed or everyone leaves and goes to it? Was that ever even a possibility that everyone leaves or you change the lineup before Alex nope, left? Uh, no, no, we didn't want to change like full uh, full lineup because we wanted to keep keep playing that. I don't know, just people was very very motivated after Alex left and everyone wanted to just play way more. I don't know, it like, just happens when someone left and you want to prove something. When you recruited Neek, he only speaks in English in game, right? He doesn't speak Russian? No, he speaks Russian. He, I think his grandfather was Russian, and he actually speaks some Russian. And when he came oh. to the team, he, yeah. he, he even just... He, I think he just buy the book and started learning Russian even more. And he understand pretty easily. Even the, like, one hour before, we were just playing normal game with my Russian friends and with Neek, okay. and he was in Skype and talking, like, uh, so easily. So but in the Kupon, yeah. Yeah, Kuban doesn't know Russian, but you know the Poland and Russian like very similar languages, and he actually understand like I think thirty percent, but he don't he, he don't speak Russian. Okay. So we mainly communicate communicate in in English in LCS okay. games. Right. So you communicate, but but in the Neek lineup initially, when you, it was Dari and Genja, and, and you know just only Neek different, it was initially Russian you were talking, right? Yeah, we're only talking Russian, and if Neek doesn't understand anything, the when he just joined, we just can just translate him or something. Okay, that's a key distinction though, because if in that case, it's understandable, maybe you were looking for someone who could speak Russian when you initially were putting that player in. Because if Gambit does badly now, as we've seen this split, people are going to think, okay, well, if you're now speaking English, 
now there's not that problem that you have to find a Russian speaker, right? Now you can get anyone in the world who wants to join Gambit and they can join whatever positions and speak English, right? Yeah, but it's still hard. When first Kubon came, it was super hard for me. Even when we actually benched Diamond for like uh, one week, I think, for Lulex. We were playing with me, Nick, Genja, Kubon and Lulex. And like Genja doesn't talk at all in game, he talks only in Russian, just a bit. And all the time they ask Genja something, I have to translate from Russian to English. Then from English to Russian, it was like, I can't even focus on game and it was pretty bad. What do you think the storyline of this season is for Gambit? Mm, nothing, just... I think everyone understands that we were struggling. We were struggling so much in the split, and we just try to change players. That's what everyone does when they're losing a lot. Monty, he, he what he just said there. What everyone does when they're losing. When we when we get that t that TSM discussion about Lost Boy joining, even though we both agreed Lost Boy was an upgrade potentially, we said like, okay, it's actually a bad move to do a desperation move. That's sort of like saying. Okay, I've accepted that I could not possibly have succeeded with the old lineup, and now I have to just gamble on something, you know. Like, isn't it? It's better to stick with what you have and try and work with it if possible, right? I think it's really hard to tell in the in the TSM instance, um, and it seems like it has been the, the right move for them. But I don't think I would have made the same decision. Yeah, so, it's it's only because it was super late to actually do that. It was just yeah. pretty much after before the playoffs. Well, when you did this move, okay, Edward, you took out Diamond Fox and Darian. Like, what was the best case scenario there? Because the problem, as far as I can see, is even even if those players had performed and they'd done decently, you'd won a few games. Unless they'd been amazing, wouldn't there have been a point in time where you'd still have thought, like, yeah, but if we put Diamond Fox back in and he's back at his level, then he's going to be better than they could be or something like that? Wouldn't they always have been a switch back to the old players? Actually, I think when we changed Diamond Fox, we knew that... Diamond will get, just get his shit together and start playing way more and way, way more confident. And it, I think even before we changed Lulex, I knew, I mean, get Lulex, I knew that he's probably going to play one or two weeks and then we get Diamond Diamond back and he's going to play way better. Uh, that what happens pretty much. The Diamond was really good, like, last week's. Ah, okay. In that case, you're actually the first team who ever used subs properly. Like, everyone claimed that... You remember that thing where Reginald said he was going to get a sub for every position and he'd swap you out if you didn't do well? Basically, you're the first team who's actually done that. That's actually a good idea, to be honest. It, what we heard, what we thought we were going to do with it, especially in TSM, which is, like, take you out of the lineup until, like, you fix things and then you can come back in. What do you think about that as an actual approach, Monty, if people could have real subs in LCS? Well, I mean, obviously that happens in Korea quite a bit, uh, less so now than it used to. And it is a bit of a double-edged sword, I think, because if we look at what happened with Frost and like their triple mid laner plan, it turned out really poorly and they switched people too much. And I also think that the pressure it created on like those three players made them kind of choke a little bit. And you know, certainly that's on them to a certain degree, but I think it can be good because it will motivate people to actually fight for their slots as long as you actually give the substitutes some time to play some games and, and be in there for a little bit. I think that's the key I'm curious. you said that, yeah. I'm curious, I'm curious how they organize scrims in that instance, though. Like, did you split your time between the starters and the subs in your scrims, or did you just go for the subs the entire time? No, we just played with subs all the time. The, I think okay. it was like one week. Well, I think it was Diamond was streaming solo queue and we're just playing uh, with with Lulex. What was what were Diamond and Darian's reactions to that? Mm. Were I they think... understandable? Were they understanding? Were they angry? Were they sad? Like, what was the what was the atmosphere? I think, in this, I think Diamond the was kind of kind of angry, but he got benched because he was Diamond was always I think trying hard, but sometimes he just even trying he. He's just, well, we're just not winning and these, the bad games is chasing us. Well, he you know he's like trying his best, but still the games is horrible. So he was really sad when he got benched. And Darren, I don't know, Darren just, for me, Darren is the guy who don't give a single fuck about anything. Edward, but. what's, people, whenever they make organizational moves, it always comes as an official thing, like Gambit, the organization has done this, okay. But I made this point when I made a point about shot calling in SK that it's actually impossible for everyone to simultaneously have an idea and to do that. It has to have, the, the idea has to come from someone and then someone also has to like make the idea happen. Someone's like the key turning point. 
So, was, was the players of Gambit themselves all got together and decided, like, a vote or something? Like, oh, we're going to take Diamond Prox out for this week. We're going to get Darien out. Did Gambit, the organizer, like, Groove came along and said, okay, they're coming out the lamp. How, how did it get decided to remove these two players? What was the system? Okay, it was, it was not actually... As a team, is, I think it's our <laughs> analyst and the Groove decided to try to just change something. It was not a team decision. I mean, the player decision. So you didn't know yourself, you just got told one day, okay, Darien and Danprox are getting benched. Yeah, just whatever, just let's try something. Because for me personally, I don't really care, like, the food to play. But also, of course I am, and I, of course I have the people who, who I like to play with. But pretty much what I want is just only winning. It doesn't matter the food. Monty, what do you think about the idea of the players getting a say or not getting a say in, in roster moves. What is your thought on this? Because actually, CLG is a prime example of where it sounds like players in the past have had some say in roster moves, etc. Uh, yeah, I think that definitely the, the players are an important part of, of roster moves and uh, making those kind of decisions. Um, I think that CLG is, we do talk a lot as a team about what we like want to do and who we want to get and definitely the players they do they do have you know a good uh, a good contribution sorry. to that situation actually i think i did a mistake actually we, i think we talked it a few times before that okay uh, so, so when you trying. have this conversation if two people get removed dead with that only leaves three people left so the other yeah. three people decided like we have to try and bench these two <laughs> uh, i mean what else what other way can it be edward come on Wait, wait, can you repeat one more time? Because Okay, <laughs> there are there are five members in Gambit. There's Darien, yeah. Diamond Prox, Neek, Edward, yeah. Danger. Now, if Darien and Diamond Prox are getting removed, I'm going to go ahead and guess Darien and Diamond Prox didn't say, hey, I think we should probably kick uh, Darien and Diamond Prox from the lineup. They're fucking bums. So I'm guessing the other three <laughs> had some say in it. And since three outweighs two, I'm going to guess those three maybe decided the decision. Is this what you're suggesting? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Genja backstabbed everyone. I get you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Finally, he spoke. They were like, he was like, Well, Dan actually, Pops, Genja is the guy who okay. doesn't want to change just anything. He just wants to. No, well, we've the... seen that now. So, okay. When they made this move and they removed Diamond Prox from the lineup, did hmm? you actually think this is it fixed now? We're going to win with these new guys and it's going to turn everything around? Mm. No, I was the jungle is like at the meta we changed diamond. It was the thing if you get solo queue jungler, it's gonna be super bad. But as I said, that we just changed pretty much. I was thinking we're gonna change Lulex for one week, and that's what happened. Because if you get solo queue jungler at the meta when you it was a time when people lane swapping so much, and you have to just double jungle and shit. So it was pretty like uncomfortable for him, for him because he didn't play much in teams he, he was pretty much the solo queue listing player and he was playing evil and pretty much nothing else but he was really good at his champions so okay monty <laughs> let me think how to phrase this okay what is it in the past monty we've talked about solo queue and the fact that okay in korea it's actually a huge thing that you must maintain a level of solo queue to maintain your skills and also I guess just to get extra practice in, okay, when your team's not practicing. But when we've talked about NA solo queue, you've even directly said that aside from streaming, okay, players like Double Lift maybe wouldn't play solo queue for a while or they would just have periods where they just only played the scrims. What is your, as a general rule, should all pro players at the L LCS level be playing an amount of solo queue each day, each week, Monty? What's your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think you do have to play solo queue just uh, to keep your mechanics up and to uh, make sure that you you know, have enough practice on new champions that you know lane matchups well enough. Solo queue is highly useful just for getting into the rhythm of the game. So, I mean, I certainly agree with that. And I think one of the reasons why, um, you know, we fell off is that a lot of the CLG's players weren't as invested in solo queue towards the end of the season, which was problematic and something that I couldn't really enforce or actually see how much they were playing solo queue because I wasn't at the house. That's one of the problems with me you know, not being there full-time. There are a lot of problems with me not being there full-time. It's not an ideal situation, and I don't pretend that it is. Uh, but out here, we haven't had any problems with motivation and solo queue. But, I mean, people are just soloing, doing all the time. So it's. I think that it's going to be helpful to uh, have that up. So when yeah, I did actually, my... Yeah, go on, Edward. Yeah, 
when we play this, it was the A5 time when we played the second hour tourna tournament in Hanover. It actually, do you guys remember when we played the uh, Urgot Soul Lane and with blue buff and I was jungle Alistar with diamond procs? Like roaming around? Yeah. Yeah, at that time, actually, I think it's Genzo just went playing Urgot and he was playing some stupid support who doesn't do shit on lane and he was like pretty much 1v2. And he, after that, he just told me, can you just go away from my lane? I can just 1v2. And we just actually just made a strategy when I'm roaming with Alistar with diamond procs and he just saw lane against two people. And that so was pretty much solo queue. Yeah, pretty much he played with some random guy in solo queue and it's helped, it's uh, gained the strategy. It's like yeah. actually a lot of things you can meet in, in solo queue that people don't get serious. Uh, they don't realize that it's actually good. Uh, a lot of new champions become like popular only because like some people just wrecked someone in solo queue. Like in NA, I think everyone came playing Talon. I think just maybe Void by Van Solo Q played some random champion and he got wrecked by a random player who plays Talon and he started playing Talon. Okay, but yeah, you do you do learn a lot too because sometimes there are picks that uh, one guy is able to figure out that you can shoehorn into the competitive scene or something like that as well. So there is that advantage also. Um, and their Twitch chat seems very confused because they're looking at our accounts and says we have we haven't been playing. We have we have new accounts, guys. So we've been playing on different accounts than the ones you knew about. Okay, that's exa that leads so into good, exactly good my topic right now, though, Monty. If I was to tell you that two players in an LCS team either very rarely ever played solo queue for like a year, or they just never played solo queue for a year and they just kept scrimming only, that that in itself would be, they'd need some sort of policing of that, right? There's something would have to be reversed about that if those two players were in a pro team, right? No matter who they are. Unless their results were phenomenal, I would agree with that statement. So that's what Genji is. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Well, what, do you mean, what do you mean, Genji? Why are you volunteering Genji there? I, I didn't even say Genji. What do you mean? I mean, the Genji is that kind of a player. He oh, okay. actually, when we scream, uh, he usually don't play solo queue at all, pretty much. Okay. But when we stop screaming, he can play like 10 games solo queue in, in one day. But he just, I think he just don't like to play that much in, in one day. Okay. Because but... the, yeah. So I did an interview with Alex Hitch. He'd left the Gambit, and he said to me that that Darian and Genja just never played solo queue. Was he exaggerating? Mm, I think actually the Genja and Darian got like two or three Smurf accounts, but so there were Smurfs don't... from Alex Hitch himself. Wasn't he in the same fucking room? <laughs> yeah, actually, we're. And he was like, "What are you playing game? over there?" Like, oh, I'm just watching a stream of <laughs> like what? How did he not know they were playing? Either they were playing, or they weren't. Yeah. Before the when we boot came in Kiev before the playoffs, we I played with Genzo like so much duo queue games. Like I think in how how with two weeks of boot camp, but we played like I think thirty duo queue games. It's like more than in the last three years. But and, and Diamond uh, actually Genzo played with Darius also duo queue. They I think they get like Diamond one in like two weeks from uh, the the right smooth accounts with zero elo. When you oh, say they, they were actually playing solo queue, I made this point to Soaz, okay. Soaz plays solo queue, but then I asked him, well, how many games do you play top lane? And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe one out of four, which is like, okay, well, that's, that's not really, okay, that, you're keeping up some level of mechanics, but you're not even playing your role. The story is, even if Genja played solo queue, didn't he just play like fucking Ash for like a year and a half or something, even when he wasn't playing it in meta games? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think Genja plays Ash in solo queue because we don't let him to play in 5v5. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's ideal practice then, isn't it? Okay. So the point I'm getting to here is, this is a problem, it sounds like in Alex's era, this is a problem that was in the back of people's minds. Like, okay, if we start to lose, then that's the reason why, okay, people don't play solo queue enough. Do, do Genja and Darian play solo queue a lot now? Uh, yeah, Genja, oh, I mean, Darian is right now, is, I think, it's like six or 700 points in Challenger. Because he just sitting at home playing solo queue while we just was playing in LCS, and Genja, yeah, he played some. I think he played like 20 games the last two weeks. Uh, actually, I'm checking his account sometimes, just for fun. <laughs> Do you think that when you got rid of Alex, did you try to stay the same Gambit style of play? Did you decide like it has to be a totally new style of play now? But what what is Gambit style for you? Well, to me, Gambit style is like. See if we don't lose in the first 15 minutes, then win at 22 minutes in this fight. Yeah, we, okay, we, we okay, got yeah, the dragon. <laughs> yeah? 
Yeah, actually, we have so much troubles in early game, but I think if we survive early, like 20 minutes, even or even 15, we're just best team in LCS, but we can't just do it. We're always getting like super behind. But if you can see the games we were even, we just almost uh, won them, uh, almost every game. The games against SK, against Alliance, we won, won some games. Uh, I don't know, against any team. We're just getting super behind early game. Monty, what do you think Gambit style is? If you had to define the, the Alex Itch Gambit style? Well, we've talked about this. They're the Wolfpack, man. The instinctual team that uh, just takes that one fight and makes the, uh, the crazy play. You know, not a lot of uh, pre-planning or foresight, but kind of a more reactive, uh, raw style. Because that's the thing. We actually, when Gambit had Alex Itch, we, we've discussed them many times on this show. And we even joked that, like, okay, they might be one of the only teams where it might actually not make sense to even analyst in the sense that, like, if you did just change their style totally, maybe they wouldn't have the same strength. You know, I even made a joke to Edward that, like, they should get an analyst and all he should do is tell them what to do for the first 10 minutes and at, like, level yeah. one, two, and three. And then after that, he should just leave. Like, after that, we do everything. Like, as long as we stay even to this point, we don't die at level one, then, then we can take over, like... What, what do you think, Edward? Coming into this, was, was you were you a team that never wanted an analyst? You never wanted that sort of early game stuff of like these picks and these invades and. Well, we as a game we always doesn't like to invade. I don't know, it's just random. The Genza just not coming, or he just don't don't want to because he doesn't even come when there's no minions. What the fuck's he doing? <laughs> I know, he just sit in Tibush and, and waiting for minions. Okay, I think that's in, even in worse than Double if there, dude. Double if at least is like farming minions and won't, won't come to the team fight. No. Genja's like just in lane doing nothing. <laughs> just like, Genja, please, there's not even wolves or anything. He's like... Well, if Genja, <laughs> if Genja <laughs> yeah. thinks that invade is nothing for the, uh, 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 at this patch, at least the time when the ward was, you can put the ward at 30 seconds, the invade is pretty much nothing. You you can go and every, every time you, you will spot the enemies and uh, you can just do counter invade, uh, what we what we're doing all the time. I've got so a question. Much in, yeah. in, invade is way more uh, risky than uh, staying safe so at, the, in, at the moment. In the past LCS splits, where Gambit always did fine and figured out a way to succeed, still in this current uh, last the spring split, one of the key differences was all the lane swaps, right? And so you had a team like Copenhagen Wolves, who if you look at their roster, they weren't a very amazing roster, they, well, pun intended. They, were, they weren't a great roster, they didn't have lots of skilled players, but they just abused lane swaps super hard so that their bot lane could do super well. Did, did Gambit not look at this and go like, oh, why don't we do this? Well, I think, uh, I think it's more depends on AD carries. Because if you compare Forgiven at that time and Genja, it yeah, was let's go ahead, let's forget, let's compare them. Two, Bring it two on, different type of players. Okay. Forgiven is like one v nine player, and Genja is a support. How can you compare these guys? Okay. Like Forgiven gets, he wants to get like five hundred creeps in like forty minutes, get six items, and pretty much carry the game solo. Okay. Uh, Genja is like playing Varus, playing Ash, playing Kogmov, using his like uh, CC and trying to, to peel for team. And the copying was this doing the pretty much opposite of that. Okay, I mean, fair enough. To be fair, I'm pretty sure Genja wants to get 500 creeps in like 10 minutes, and he also wants six <laughs> items. They're just not the items you're thinking of, Edge. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, same same sort of player, really. It's it's Zephyr and Doran's blades. Yeah. Well, so, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> so explain yeah. to us, Edward. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, here's no, a, here's I, an ideal kidding. scenario for you. <laughs> this is this is a situation where people are going to think when I set this question up that I'm putting like two opposite people together and they're going to clash, okay? So I'll describe it like this. You might not know this, Edward, but Monty is not a fan of Genja. He actually has repeatedly criticized him. He's even used the term never go full Genja. I think we all know what <laughs> meme he's referencing there. He, he thinks that Genja does suboptimal builds. In this way, Monty's actually quite similar to Doublelift. Because Doublelift also has similar views on Genja. Yeah, I know. Not all of them that you get to see in interviews, believe it or not, though. But another thing, there's a little, there's a little <laughs> Easter egg for you there, guys. <laughs> but anyway, so they think that Genja plays in a suboptimal way. He doesn't do it the right way. That's not the way you're supposed to play AD carry, okay? So now everyone's going to think, Edward, that I'm going to pass it over to you and I'm going to say, come on, Edward, tell us how go good Genja is and how he does everything right. But actually, 
Edward plays with Genja, and Edward thinks that Genja doesn't do things optimally, and he doesn't play the way that Ed, Eddie Cash should be played. So actually, you two just agree with each other, right, Edward? You, you, he just, he's a suboptimal player, and you just got to do what you got to do, right? Okay, let's go through this. Let's go, how motherfucker. Many, how, how many times let's we go played full against, Genja. How many times we played against COG when it was double lift on? I think they, like, nine out of ten games, double lift got direct as fuck, and he, he didn't do shit, pretty much. <laughs> so Keep it going, keep it coming. Well, it's like <laughs> that would have his own like mindset, like yeah. pretty much the same one v nine. But I don't know, like Genza. I don't agree. I mean, there were there were flaws back then, definitely, uh, and I think that a lot of that has uh, has changed since. When was the last time we even played? Like. Yeah, I think it was. Well, to be fair, Monty, your team hasn't been in national competition for about two years, so you know yeah. that's true. I think it was hey, come on. IPL we were in Battle of the Atlantic. Ah, yeah, my the, the match, yeah. The, Last the time it was IPL five, I think. Yeah, IPL five before okay. the World Championship or after. Not after, after yeah. Yeah, that after, yeah. And I think we played two one against them in. Okay. It was best of three. Yeah, we played two one. So it was can, time when it was time when Lokodoko was in CLG, I think. Yeah, good times. And and it all ended up happily best best after times. after, yeah. It all ended up great. So, <laughs> explain to us then, if 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 from the outside to someone who doesn't know all the details, Edward, it seems like Genji is sort of a suboptimal player. He he builds weird things. He picks champions that other people aren't playing. He plays in a way where sometimes he's too passive or he just doesn't want to fight ever. He doesn't turn up to team fights. Are we missing something? Is there something about Genji that if we knew about this, about him as a person or a player, or maybe the way he communicates, that it would all make sense? Can you think of something you could enlighten us about? Well, I think Genji is always thinking like one month uh, through the what is going on going on right now. He's just doing the things like what you have to do, like in one month, pretty much. It pretty much, it's not working the time he's doing. Uh, excuse, you uh, mean is he, he is he a time traveler? Are you suggesting he's a month behind? No, he's he's one month ahead. Of oh, us. okay. Yeah. <laughs> or even more. I don't know. Okay. He just uh, when everyone he just played Kogma with Twenty Force at Worlds. Okay. Everyone was like, "What the fuck is Retard doing? Like, uh, what, why he's building the shit?" But everyone now is building Twenty Force. It's like best item on Kogma. Pretty Edward. Much. Edward, you're cherry picking. Nobody's building six Doran's blades and Zephyr. Edward. Like <laughs> Edward, I've got a question for you here, Edward. You weren't in Gambit yeah. at the Season 3 World Championship. When you watched that game, you were thinking, the fuck are you doing? Trinity Force on Cogmore, <laughs> you idiot. That's no, why I no, left Gambit, I you thinking, fuck. I was thinking it's good because okay. I just used to play as well with Trinity Force. I just like Trinity Force. It's like really good item on Cogmore. Okay, so when you say that, you, you, you were partially joking. I think that you said he's a month and a half. But he's try I think what you're trying to say is he's trying to think ahead of the meta, okay? Yeah, pretty much. But the thing I didn't like from Genja, it was, I think, pretty much Mana, Mune, Ash. The only thing I mostly disagree with his build. But if you think about it, like, if you survive with tier on lane, the Mana Mune is an item who gives more damage than every other item, right? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you you answered your own question there, Edward. You said, if you survive the lane. Yeah, pretty much. But the yeah, time yeah. he was playing with Void yeah, also. Yeah. No, no, but that's like if I invest all my money into bad stocks. Well, if I don't lose right it all, back, then sorry. actually I might gain lots. Yeah. Oh, Monty's just bailing on us here. At this point, this this call right here is like an old Gambit team fight. Okay, me and you, Edward, we're gonna have to carry this motherfucker with one man down. That guy's off over there handling his own business, and then if we can survive to there, he'll join us and he'll win the whole game and get all the praise. That's how it's like. It's how it used to work, right, with Genja. I guess I would not. I was not in teams at the time, you know. Okay, fine. So I can't say much about okay, it. Okay. Well, while Monty's gonna let me ask you about Genja then. So, okay, when he does these builds, like a bit. Okay, let's give him a direct example. When he d he did the build at IEM, where he refused to build the Last Whisper against tanks, and he kept building the Zephyr. Yeah. Is that something where you've ever seen it before? He does it in a pro game. Did you already know about that build? Did you know it was going to happen? Yeah, we were practicing and. In, in scrims, he was doing actually pretty decent. We were like playing against champ teams with two... I don't know, he just was kiting with Lucian. He was playing Lucian, right, all the time? I the time. So, yeah. Lucian and Varus. Sort of thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was just building like so much move speed. Even he was building like Boots of Sweetness and getting the Alacrity Boots. Uh, he started builds at the time the 
Static Shift, what gives more more moves to be than yeah, Phantom yeah. Dancer, and he do Zephyr as well. I know why he didn't didn't build uh, Last Whisper. It was weird for me, but he was just going to, like full move speed build or something, and kiting people. But it's not. It, it's just not gonna work against Kassadin, you know. Okay. Uh, we just lost against Kassadin, I think, that time against KTB. And when when he does these things, okay, that that was just an example, okay. Maybe there was logic behind that, but okay, some of the builds people don't understand. If Genja does a build that people don't understand and it seems suboptimal, I think part of where people get confused is that he doesn't do it once and it fails and then he doesn't do it again. He does it as many times as it wants, it seems like. If Genja wants to do something, he can do whatever he wants. Is there no one in the team after you lose a game where he does a weird build who says, like, Genja, why don't do that. Do, do something different. Does no one ever say that to him? Well, if you actually say that, he can just instantly go on you and say, why you do this shit? Then he, like... He... Yeah. You, you do know that that's like the worst way to have a relationship, right? Because it's just distracting from the issue at hand. You know, if you if you have your girlfriend and you get in a yeah, fight, you don't yeah, like wait. bring up all the other shit, right? So why do you let him do that? You'd be like, no, we're yeah. talking about this right now. We can talk about this other thing later. Yeah, of course we're doing, but every everyone everyone have his like view of the game and why we lost this, you know? Okay. So uh, for Genza is like alone, and we're four people. He it was like. Uh, pretty much half and or one year ago, Genzo always is, he has his own game knowledge. I don't know. He knows more than everyone else. I think actually, I think Genzo is like more most smart people in league. But he most intelligent he just, person in league. I mean, no, more smart in game. He knows more than everyone else. Ah, okay. I mean, He's actually, very, you mean do you mean just AD carries or all players in the whole world? No, no, no. He he know how to win the game. More than thing, every other he, player in the world. So Genji yeah. knows how to win the game more than Faker. He, yeah, of course. Okay, that's a statement right there, Edward. <laughs> Genji knows how to win the game, but okay. he is not doing like you know. Genji doesn't talk uh, much in game, and he's he said this to me when he played the game. He is really focused on himself, and he can't talk much. He's, he's that kind okay. of player, but sorry, but mate, he... can't talk in the middle of CSing at the moment. We'll get back to you. Leave me a voicemail. But 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 okay. when it comes to talk after game or before game, he can hear you just put, say everything, and you can't disagree with him because he's just saying everything what is really good and smart. So he's he's good at breaking down the games afterwards. I mean, it is hard to talk when you're actually thinking a month in advance. You know, being t Time Lord Genja, he's so ahead. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, I, no, Genzo just, you know, as far as I can tell, yeah. Genzo just don't talk much in game, and that's it, pretty much. See, when he says about Genja being one month in advance, I actually think that that explains everything. Because what happens is Genja doesn't know that he's one month in advance. He thinks that's now. And so sometimes he takes all his money yeah. and he invests into a stock that's going to skyrocket in a month. But actually, in the three weeks before, sometimes it dips so low that you lose all your money. But if you can survive that, then you get the benefits. That's the whole Genja <laughs> approach <laughs> taken forward there, right? If you can survive going totally broke and have no money, then you will get the skyrocket. That's that's his whole career summed up right there, Monty. And Gambit's <laughs> playing style. It just sounds to me like the way that, that Edward describes Genja, yeah. he sounds like Russian Chowster. Like, the guy who's really good at breaking down the game afterwards, but who just can't make the right calls in game. So no, far, Genzo, is, yeah. Genzo is making right calls in games, that's the problem, but he's... Do they just the in his thing, mind and he doesn't communicate them? No, no, the thing is, when we play with Darren and Diamond, uh, when Nick joined, I think, Genzo was just saying what he have to do, and it was like something later that it was just... Uh, do the quote. Uh, Genzo said, uh, Darren, come meet. Yeah. Uh, I will go farm bot, and Darren answer him, I am going bot, go meet. That's what happened, and Genzo is getting fucking annoyed, and he don't want to say anything anymore, you know? He's just the kind of guy, when you don't listen to him, he's just, whatever, I'm not gonna talk anymore. So Genji is one month in advance, and he's got all the- He's like, you know in Back to the Future 2, where the whole plot is that that character went- went forwards in time and he got like a sports almanac and he goes back and he bets on all the games because he already knows who's going to win what happens is after the game okay you all go up to genji and you go genji we lost the game like what happened man and he goes darian look in your left pocket and darian pulls out an envelope and he opens it up and it says you died four times at the top he's like what the fuck how did you do it like i knew you'd do that i told you not to but you didn't listen to me okay no but it, but seriously it actually happening very often when we, after a game, saying like, Genzo, so, why we did, did we lose the game? 
So if Genja is making these these calls that you feel are right, uh, what's going on with your comms? Like, why haven't you adjusted to like have have Genja like be more like have the other players listen to Genja more if you feel that he's right? I don't know. It's more depends to Genja. He just have to have more. I don't know how to say. He needs to. He needs to like talk more himself or not get frustrated when things start going bad. Does he get like very easily frustrated and just stop talking? Let me Google Translate. <laughs> I, think called, I think it's called patient or something. He's not patient? Uh, well, yeah, pretty much. He just... He loses his temper. Way, too, yeah. way too much. Okay. Okay. So here's Have a question. Have you considered then. like sports psychologist or something like that? I have no idea. I, I, I think, think SK like has a guy you can talk to. Monty, I, mean, yeah. I, I think you you might be setting some poor sports psychologist up there for a world of hurt. It might be a fucking watchman where when he actually starts like looking into the abyss of Genja's eyes and start exploring that, <laughs> suddenly his own life will unravel behind him and he'll wonder what the fuck. And then Genja will be like, well, what about your problems, psychologist? Do you love your wife? And then that guy will just completely fall apart and then Genja will win again and he'll be right. Okay, so I have a, I have a real question here though, Monty. Haven't you noticed this trend that's happening, Monty, where even though the EU teams, some of them are great teams and they're incredible and they have their own style and they all, their own flair and they win, but every time we bring an EU player onto this show, I get the sense that Monty's sat there and behind his stony visage, he's like, Jesus, how do they fucking live like that? They're like animals. <laughs> because every single team is like, so ours is like, and then if the analyst says I've done it wrong, I'll explain to him why I was right and that I'm a three times LCS champion and then I'll tell him to go and sit in his corner. And then you're thinking to yourself like, no, you know, the analyst and the coach has to have some input and people have to listen and they have to try things out. I get the sense that Monty would die if he had to be the analyst of fucking Ana Alliance, Fnatic, Gambit. You wouldn't be able to handle it, right, Monty? No, I couldn't. What do you think, think of this general trend, though? It sounds like it's a trend in Europe, right? These teams are all... The players are out of control, right? The, the lunatics have taken all the asylum. <laughs> That's right. They need somebody with a whip in there. Get them in line. Edward, I can we get it, someone it, in there to whip Genji into shape? Uh, uh, Could anyone uh, go head-to-head -head with Genji and match wits with him and use the power of mesmerism to overcome his, his ability to talk them out of it and say, no, Genji, no Zephyr? No Zephyr. And then when he's like, yeah, but what about you? And what about the things that you've done? Go, Genja, that doesn't change anything. The Zephyr is shit, mate. And then he'd have to, eventally he'd have to, like, when two dogs are face to face, he'd have to back down and show, and show also, submission. And also, where's, where's the person who's being like, hey, Genja, just calm down. Keep, keep making the calls. You're really smart. You know, we want you to, to help, like, make the calls in the game. But you can't get angry. Like, you just have to, you just have to be cool. Well, we're trying that to do, like, actually, the lately the games we played in Super Week, we actually listened to Genja a lot and I did. We we started doing the Drake calls with me and Genja as well. Only listen us. So if Diamond say go Dragon, we're like no, we can't do it. So we're not doing Dragon anymore. But before it was like 50-50 for us all the time. Yeah, see, I think the problem was you were going too hard, okay? Everyone's approach, they were too Russian, okay? You were too aggressive, <laughs> you are too in your face, and so Groove would come in when he lost, he'd have the belt, and he'd be whipping Diamond, he'd be whipping Darian, and then when he went to whip Genja, Genja would, like, stick one fist up, and it would, like, wrap around it, and then he'd pull get Groove over, like... You, no one tells Genja what to do. <laughs> what you needed to do was, like, after the game, Genja's really frustrated, no one was listening, and you Genja, come on, man, come on. Come on, Genja. Come and oh, sit next to me, Genja. I want to have a little word with you. You sit, yeah, with him on the you sit with him on the porch on one of those swinging chairs, like in America, in, in front of the bayou. You say, Genja, come on, lean back. Have some cocoa. What's wrong, bro? He's like, no, you know, everyone Genja's wasn't listening really, to me. Genja's really calm at this point. He, okay. Until he don't come and, like, uh, touch him or just uh, annoy him more, he won't talk with you. Like, he, he, I think he's getting frustrated, of course, but... If you don't talk to him, he's not going to talk to you. What I don't understand is, okay, you're saying that Genja gets frustrated and he gets angry and he doesn't know how to communicate, but the Genja I've seen, and even the one that I met and talked to and I've seen on every LCS broadcast, looks like he's on, like, permanently on fucking, like, diazepam or whatever those snipers use to, like, make their fucking heartbeat, like, never go above, like, 60 BPL or whatever. Sit perfectly still. Like I've seen some of those videos, dude, where you lose and everyone else in the team is like head in their hands. Then the camera pans backwards and Genji's just sat like looking at the screen with like the neutral expression, like, <laughs> "When do we go home? The game is open now." Like, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So, so yeah, do, when he goes behind stage, though, 
he, he's an, he gets animated? Is he an excitable guy? No, actually, you know the how it looks the OCS studio? We just go behind the stage, go to our room, sitting, and actually we're turning on the game we, we just played, and just looking some uh, where we just do uh, the mistakes with why we lose the game, but nothing else, pretty much. And then we're just playing solo queue, just waiting for another game. Monty, you love Moscow. Despite all that we've discussed here, you love Moscow 5. A very entertaining Absolutely. team. Absolutely. Something awesome yeah. about them. So let's make a clear distinction between Moscow 5 and Gambit here. It's going to go like this. Moscow 5, one of the best teams, in the, probably the best team in the world at one point in time. Awesome team. When you heard that Edward had left, could you even understand why that would happen? No. Because, like for me, there were it was uh, it was very surprising because the roster was so strong, and they they you know that's what was so special about Moscow Five is that they seemed to have this inherent synergy that made them really really strong. And I think that in the early days, um, like just they it, it was Moscow Five, they found the right group of players. And they had that dedication at the right time before the scene had developed into what it is now in the West in terms of having like a lot of support staff and coaches. You know, uh, Gambit or Moscovy was there. They had Groove. Like there was all this other stuff going on uh, for them. They had early infrastructure. They were one of the first teams to kind of fully dedicate themselves in the West to the game, like full time playing. And it and they also just had like the the right admixture of players to be one of the great teams. And um, I mean, I think Gambit fell behind in terms of infrastructure, which is uh, part of their problem right now because they can't, they can, the, the inherent synergy is no longer enough. But I would, for the reason that the synergy existed, like I was surprised that Edward uh, left the team for sure. Actually, that was the time when we lost to Fnatic 3 2, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. The Spring Split. And I was telling to team that we need to change right now because the world is coming soon. And I was feeling that. Uh, we're not gonna just win the worlds okay. with the with this team because the way Darren at the time played it was he was playing really good until the moment we played the final game. When we play final game, he just I don't know he's doing some weird shit and he can just lose the game alone pretty okay. much. Yeah. The point I saw saw this so yeah. so pretty much I wanted to change something in team or I just, I didn't want to keep playing okay. there because. When you don't want to, when you don't see the, what is going on in team, pretty much is really bad. So I know. I think even if I stay in game at the time, we would have get second or third place in worlds. Because the way Voidal played in world finals against Nigel Swarder, uh, it was pretty <laughs> ridiculous. Monty, you 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 remember how quickly you pulled Loco Doco up when he made that comment about Alliance winning worlds if he'd have been the coach. Edward just said if he'd have been in Gambit. They'd probably have finished second or third in Worlds. Well, just factually, they were on the same side of the bracket as SK Telecom, and I don't think they could have won that game. Uh, the games against Nodge and Black Sword, I'd give it a larger chance, but I'd still give 70% to Sword. But Sword, of course, was not one of the stronger teams in Korea at that point and kind of fluked their way, way into Worlds last year, as we know. So I'd say still 70% chance to Sword. No, but why? The, the game was... Why just uh, Gambit lose the game? Because both got crushed so much. They just keep play, picking Sona against Trash and Twitch, and that is, is super bad. And the way uh -huh. Voido was playing Sona, it was really, like, Yeah, unsafe. he didn't play well. But but you're assuming that you would have played well in those games, and I still see that... I still believe that Sword would have won. And I'm not saying you wouldn't have, but you're, you're citing, like, oh, this guy had a bad series. You could have had a bad series, too. You never know. Yeah, of course. You know? Just saying that I just the way he played, like it's just yeah, unsafe. Yeah, it was bad. No, no, no. He just the, I just saw the runes he just used. It's just unsafe. You I guess trash like the place the support of Nigel Sword. I don't remember. Do you remember who Kane. was that actually? Kane, yeah. Kane and Pride. Yeah, they just go full yellow against uh, that guys. You just go full like tanky runes, like uh, ye yellow and Queen's HP and go armor on uh, armor and, and blue runes. And the guys can't do anything. That's what I did actually against uh, my life uh, at Katowice, and uh, against. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys would have had a better chance, but, um, and I think you, for what it's worth, I think that team should have stayed together for Worlds because the the performance of Gambit of Gambit at Worlds was decent, but uh, I do feel they did get you know a little bit 
fortunate in terms of their groups. I mean, they didn't have to be in a group with SK Telecom and OMG, and uh, Ozone was in a massive slump at the time. So, but yeah, I, I think that maybe there was there would there definitely would have been a better chance. I think with uh, with you and the team, but, but you guys would have not made it past the semifinals. Who knows? What do you okay. mean? Who knows? Yeah, Edward, you, you keep giving us the real talk, but then you put on like a caveat, like, "Well, you can never yeah, know until you try." What right? can I? What can I else say? Like, yeah, yeah. How can how can prove that uh, we oh, were the one? Don't, but... don't prove it. Just say, Monty, you're entitled to your opinion. P.S. Fuck you. And then next topic. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's that's the correct way to do it. Okay, so I've got a question for you here, Edward. You thought to yourself, "We just lost in the final to Fnatic." Darian threw the game. He, he didn't play the way he normally did. This team can't win worlds. I've got to go to a team who I think can win Worlds. Let me join Curse Gaming with NY Jackie and Cop. Worlds, here we come. First place. No, no. Actually, the the problem was in Curse. That actually, they fin they played really good, actually, in the Spring Split, right? They, well, like, until the playoffs, yeah. Yeah, until the playoffs. But I was thinking they just played bad because they changed the support. Just Yeah, they took elements out, yeah. Yeah, and it uh, was playing... The, I don't remember his nickname. Fuck. Which player? Well, oh, oh rocks. Fuck. They used rocks. Yeah, in the they took their rocks, oh, yeah. and he was pretty much top winner, and he went to play support like two, a few weeks before the playoffs. Yeah. And what you can do? What you can expect from this guy? And of course, they lost the playoffs. But and so you thought to yourself, this team's a good team. Put me in a support, and that will be the piece we need. Then we'll be really good. Yeah. I think, but it was actually. I think I make a decision way too early i could have joined like any other eu teams and it will be even better i think well edward li listen you know the the statute of limitations has passed on that mate those teams are all gone it's all different so w w any teams you'd like to proffer that you could have joined what teams could edward have joined back then i think at the time i could have joined fanatic but holy shit just stop yeah. right there <laughs> holy shit balls it was, it was like I didn't know what yeah. what will what happened yeah. here, but I think it is. A Let me just buckle the fuck in while you give me the rest of this list. You could have joined Fnatic <laughs> instead of N-rated. You're telling me Fnatic would have had Ed Edward back then who spoke English. Just let him join, not even speak. Just flashing forwards to land like thresh hooks, like going on this motherfucker. Like I've seen in those clips that you do. That. They would have recruited you, Edward. <laughs> I don't know. I just knew that Fnatic gonna change. Okay. And read it, and I will could have tried, but I just made decision way too early. It's that I'm pretty angry on myself. Let I, just, I, I think I, if yeah. I wanted to join Fnatic, if I asked them, I, I, I'm pretty sure I would have joined them. Okay, Monty. Part of the reason why we like to do this show is we love hypotheticals. We love to think about the game and speculate and imagine. Imagine an alternate universe in which after the spring split. For some fucking reason, Fnatic who just beat Gambit recruit Edward into their LCS winning lineup, and he goes forwards with them. What what world do you think? What, what, what would Fnatic be like in this world, in your mind? Well, I don't know much about um, like uh, Edward's shot calling in game because it sounds like from our conversation so far that they they are pretty reliant on like Diamond and, and Genja for shot calling primarily. Um, and we know from talking to Soaz that like Yellow Star is. The primary shot caller on that team so i think that in terms of the the playmaking ability it would have been a good fit but i think ultimately for fanatic that yellow star has been a great option for them because he provides more than just the uh the solid support play and he's a very good support player himself now if we look back historically we couldn't have known that yellow star would be able to successfully make the ad carry to support switch in the way that he has monty was just finishing up his point there about fanatic i think right yeah, that Yellow yeah. Star was shot caller, and uh, yeah, but the thing that Yellow Star was eighty carries at the time. If I join the Fnatic, I will be uh, Yellow Star and me bot lane. So, want to change? Yeah, but what, you would have. What would have happened to you in the same scenario? Like they wanted to have Reckless in there, and so like would Yellow Star? Obviously, that would be the question. Would Yellow Star still be put over? And I think that just like what happened to N rated, it would also have happened to you because there seems to be uh, the, the Fnatic seem to like Yellow Star and want to make this move of him from AD carry to support. So I think you would have just gotten kicked like N rated did. Not really. If we did good at Worlds and like Fnatic that does at Worlds, it's I think I would have. You know, they wouldn't you know, let the elves are supported, just you know, let me and the Jerkless playing, I think. I don't know, dude. If, 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 you, if you put the scenario that after Worlds, uh, 
Who is better, Yellowstone support and Reckless or me and Reckless? And yeah, what would the answer be? Of course, like, you're gonna put me with, Yellow, with the Reckless, right? Here's something I want to just explain to the public, okay? The thing about Edward is, he's not actually like a BM person, right? He's not actually someone who's disrespectful. But Edward is one of the players where, by the way, your camera's really out of focus, Edward. But he's actually a player where if you talk to him, Edward has never met a single support player that he's played against who he thought like, wow, this guy might be better than me. He's like, every single time he's like, I'm better than that guy. I'm probably going to beat him now. If I play him the next time, I'll beat him. He beat me now. I don't know what the fuck happened. Next time I'll get his ass again. Again, Joe, what the fuck are you doing? Like, that's just naturally the way Edward is. And so as a result, Edward isn't even being BM when he says that. So I have a question to him, which goes like this. Back when you left Gambit, people used to say Edward was the best support in all of Europe. You were the all-star. It was like almost unanimous. This was the era when you were making all the plays on Thresh. Now people say, undisputed, Yellowstar is the best support in Europe. How does Gambit, how does Yellowstar now compare to Edward now at support? Well, I can say what I think about it. Yeah, go ahead. If, if your team is losing, like overall, like the support is, I think, uh, if your team is losing, you're gonna get shit on. It uh, doesn't matter. You're gonna end the game with score like 0 2, 0 2 2, or 0 3, 0 4, or something. And you never, you, you're never gonna see how the guy playing support. Like, if you put like the best support like Medlife or I don't know Yellowstar in the team, like Coping and Wolves, they, he's gonna be like I don't know they're gonna still lose, right? Probably, yeah. So, I mean, you have a point in as much as all the play. That's actually a flaw, by the way, with analysis. That all the best play. Okay, let's go into a, a little, a very brief side topic here, Monty. Don't you think there's something wrong with analysis as a field? when every single player who is top two at his position has to be in like a top two or three team in his region at that position. Uh, I'm sorry, I, you cut out a little bit right there. Can you repeat that? In terms of analysis, isn't it a flaw if in League of Legends, every single player who is considered top two at his position is also has to be on a top two or three team in his region? Yeah, no, that's that's not accurate at all. I mean, we talk about this all the time and there are ways to uh, evaluate players and if I think it is noticeable when it, you know a good player is on a less than stellar team because otherwise it doesn't make any sense to say otherwise because otherwise how would you know like how who to recruit or especially in Korea when all these players get recruited off Zenic Storm or I can tell you that these guys are really good. Like I said OQ was like fucking awesome like yeah, yeah. when he was on uh, you know, Zenic Storm, and now he's on Sword, and he's just killing it. Like he's a good player, um, so it's not impossible uh, to think that. And also, we see examples. Of, I think that I still think the best example uh, was the the KT Bullets, who arguably only had one top three player, but they were the second best team in the world. Uh, that's the opposite example because you have a high amount of synergy. You have that, and Gambit's another great example. Nobody would say that Darian is a as a, like a top three top laner. Um, but his playstyle was suited to the way that Gambit did, and his synergy with the team was apparent. So it goes both ways. Because, you know, we always make the joke the other way around, that, okay, a team who was on top falls off, and suddenly people claim... SK Telecom's the obvious example we always use. People claim that all the players except Faker are just worse, and they're all bad. And so we made the joke, okay, the skill vampires got them in the night. Skill vampires came in, they drained everyone of their skill, and simultaneously they all woke up the next day and they had no skill. It seems like people think it works in reverse as well. This is why you know there's no analysis going on, Monty. Because what happens is, someone isn't even considered top two or top three. Then tomorrow he joins the really good team, has a couple of results, not even a lot, like a big data set, and then suddenly he's top two or three. I mean, it's very unlikely anything changed with that player himself. It's just that people can't analyze. They can only analyze, is he winning? Yes, then he must be good. Is he losing? He must be bad, right? <laughs> right, of course. That's very problematic. But most teams don't think that way, so... No, most... but this is, a, this is a public thing, though. Public fans, people outside of the game sometimes got, fall into these traps. Okay, so I want to ask Edward this. Has Edward, the player, dropped off as Gambit's results have dropped off? Do you still feel like you're the same player you were before when Gambit was really good? No, I think I... When I started losing, I started playing way worse because I just at some point I just lost motivation. It becomes the days so when I actually went to LCS and I was like, "Oh well, we're gonna lose this game anyway." Like, I, I don't know. I just was lost in the team. Uh, I didn't know what to do. The time when we just lost, I think, ten games in a row. I was thinking we it's over pretty much. 
So I was playing way before than I was. I used to play normally. Okay. Hmm. And also, like, I'm the kind of the su support player that uh, I I don't like to make a calls and do some stuff overall in game. But if if I was in team, like, who just tell me what I what we have to do, what I have to do in game, I will do the better than almost everyone in the world. Like, but. Uh, I think that, but the problem is supports have to make a host more than everyone else. But I'm not that kind of player. When you went over to Curse and you had that split, which was actually a sort of underrated split because you did still manage to have an okay finish to the season at the end. The, the results went up and you finished fourth in the regular split. And then obviously you had to play against Dignitas in the playoffs and that didn't go so well. It, if you look back at that team with Curse there, did, was it a mistake to go over to that team? Mm, well, as I said, I make a really like quick decision, so I guess it was kind of a mistake, but whatever. Like, do you think it was a scenario like you described with bringing the sob in for Diamond Prox, that by leaving Gambit, it made them realize something about what Ged Edward brought to the table, or it made you realize what they brought, and then when you came back, it made it better? In the same sense as maybe subbing Diamond Prox out made him like think, oh, I have to, if I want to get back in the team, I'm going to have to fix things and practice more, or, you know, whatever it was. Is it a scenario like that? I think I, I was thinking at the time that uh, Gambit is better without me and I am better without Gambit. I think it came to the point I was thinking about that. But yeah, pretty much. And I think that's one of the reasons why, why I came back to Gambit. Because that's one of the things that's confusing. When you came back and you guys won IEM Cologne, everyone thought, oh, okay, everything's fixed now. Like, whatever there's a problem, Edward's back. They're going to be really good. They're going to be awesome. All those problems are fixed. But these problems all still were there, right? People not practicing, arguments, people not doing analysis. Weren't they all the same problems there? I know. Actually, when we, I back and we played Cologne, everyone was like, just, those guys were like different from what they used to be when I was in Gambit. Uh, Half a year ago, so pretty much I came and just totally new new guys for me. For some reason, there's not a, like uh, players, but as a persons, you know. So it was more way easier to play and communicate with them. But then it came to the same place what it was before. Monty, as a general question here, you know players in their interviews with Raya and in general PR stuff, if they get a chance to, if you ask them questions about like, oh. What do you think changed about this team when it started winning? They'll always give some really generic answer like, well, we're just such good friends now. We get along so well. And when you get along outside the game, you're going to get along in the game. And it's like like some shit out of like a fucking PR, like a Scientology video or something, right? And so they make out like this is the thing that changes it in the game, right? As a general principle, should teammates get along personality-wise and should they not be arguing? And should, should that be the way a team has to function, do you think, to be successful? No, I think as long as you're respectful in the way that you argue, uh, it's perfectly fine to not be the best of friends. I think that uh, pro players really want to have that environment, but I don't think it's it's necessary, per se. Yeah, you can hate each other, but you have to respect each other as well. Yep. And was that what Gam Gambit was like? I mean, Edward, I've heard stories that make it sound like, let's say there was a hypothetical guy called Edward. And then there was another guy, another hypothetical guy called Diamond Prox. And in the, just in this hypothetical world, not in the real world, in the hypothetical world, for some reason, they don't like each other. They argue, they insult each other. They, they don't talk to each other. But in game, they're still fucking awesome. They're still be, almost beating KT Bullets. They're still playing really awesome. They're almost winning LCS. How can these players, these hypothetical players who don't get along, be doing so awesome inside the server, Edward? Yeah, I can say that we... We were not like close to each other, even with Diamond. But it's more like when you when we went to the game all the time, we're just forgetting about all the stuff and just playing and like we're just best friends in pretty much it. But uh, let me think. Yeah, pretty much. But when it came came to the point when you even uh, start affect to the people like really bad in the game as well like you don't want to just say let's go to like this uh i don't like diamond and i don't want to see say him like oh there's a enemy jungler you can go here there uh, because i just don't like him but if when it comes to this then you're gonna lose like so much but you well pretty much let's go to now then okay because i have a question about lcs that i want to get your take on 
these problems, a lot of them, it sounds like they actually existed a long time ago. It's not like they're recent problems and that's why the team lost now. These problems of people not practicing or people not wanting to play every day or communication problems within the team. It sounds like a lot of these problems actually exist because Gambit competes in LCS and you have to travel all the time and you have to play every single week and you all have to be right in your face. You have to be with the team at all the time. Whereas in the past, you played online a bit and then you had one tournament coming up in three weeks and you practiced a week before the tournament and you got good and you went to the tournament then you had two weeks off and you know in the old season two format of like a circuit of tournaments is that a better system for gambit like would these problems still exist if there was no lcs yeah i think if it was no lcs there the alex will be still in gambit and will be i think still like number top top two team in, in Europe because it, actually it's super hard to fly every week uh, yeah the thing was when we was in Moscow 5 the time was season 2 we pretty much uh, it was tournament then 2 months break then tournament again pretty much right uh, and we pretty much play tournament we won I am Kiev then we went home for like 2 weeks uh, we played like a few days solo queues and start parks again then went to boot camp in Moscow played 2 weeks before that before the tournament and went to uh, uh, another tournament that was pretty good and we didn't get like overtired or something it was way better for Gambit Monty what do you think on this as a general topic because this is something that okay I'll give you an analogy in Starcraft there's two worlds of Starcraft there's the foreign world which is tournaments like MLG Dreamhack IEM and they're all tournaments that take place over two to three days and everyone you know roughly who the whole field is but you don't know who you're going to play yet maybe you know your group but you don't know who will be in the round of 16 you don't know who will be in the round of 8 if you get to the final you definitely don't know who you'll play so you generally practice and you cycle up to the tournament you try to be ready a few days before you go to the tournament and if you play really well for three days you win the whole tournament you become the champion meanwhile the other world is GSL and if you play in GSL it's like OGN you play it takes a month you know who you're going to play a week in advance. You practice for that one opponent. Once you beat them, they're practicing for you. You know, this it's a totally different world. And as a result, it's very rare there's crossover, okay? Usually the crossover only comes from the amazing GSL players can cross over to the other one, obviously. But usually the other way doesn't work, right? In League of Legends, have you seen a trend or some pattern where teams who used to be good in the tournament format aren't as good in the week-to-week-to-week -to -week -to -week league format? or vice versa where you've seen people come up in the league format who maybe if it was just tournaments every single week wouldn't have wouldn't have had as much success what do you think um i do think to a certain degree that fanatic is like that because they seem to be able to turn it on and turn it off and yeah i mean they finished uh you know towards the top of the standings uh, of course in the in the eu lcs like this season um but yeah, they also are like a team that's known for slumping. I do think that what was scary about Moscow Five back in the day is that they were a team that would get together to boot camp very seriously. They could up their performance level well. You know, they didn't always win the online tournaments or stuff like that, but they could actually like whenever they would really dedicate themselves to going to an event, it, they would pretty much show up to play. Um, I do think it's less so that way in terms of Korean teams, uh, especially because now that we have more established, like the established leagues, the Korean teams still go to these IEM events and pretty much just crush everybody, um, especially this year. And there, there hasn't been like a, an instance of, you know, a foreign team really beating a Korean team um, at one of these like shorter events uh, since, I mean, Gambit did it. Uh, with Frost and Blaze at IEM. Of course, at Worlds, we had Ozone, but I, that was like a month long, so I'm not really like counting that as much if we're talking just the weekend events. So I'm trying to think of, of other teams that weren't just kind of one-offs, like the original SK Telecom roster with Reaper. So I guess I don't see the same parallels, but it's hard to say because the, the system there really aren't that many international tournaments that are just a weekend in League of Legends anymore compared to StarCraft, which still has them all the time, so. It would get if the LCS moves to Russia and every time all the teams have to fly to Moscow to play LCS, then we can see who's <laughs> like... Best team in Europe. So, what what is going on? Can you guys just not get visas, or do you not want to live in Cologne? What I actually don't well, know what the what the like issue is. We can be in Europe in half a year, only ninety days, or only yeah, ninety days, pretty much. And if we if we stay in Europe, pretty much, we can come uh, to Europe um, next half a year. So pretty much, we have to fly back all the time. 
Monty, here's yeah, a scenario so where... What I, happened with Alex Stitch? I'm just curious what, what his deal is then. He joined oh, NIP, and then because they're in Sweden, their company, he's allowed to get a European visa to Sweden. Now, here's the interesting God, thing, so Monty. Your company is yeah. Russian. That's the problem. No, no okay, that's the you, interesting you. part, Monty. Edward doesn't have to say anything here. And I'm just going to preface this by saying I love Gambit. I think they're an awesome organization. They've been re they always retweet my shit. They're, they're actually one of the most proactive in promoting their brand. But I'm going to give you an interesting little, little tidbit here, Monty. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, that would make sense, right? If Gambit was a Russian organization, then of course he couldn't get a visa because they're not in the European Union and, you know... But, ah, oh, no, Monty, you remember, any time you've ever seen any press release or anything about Gambit, it always stated that they were from the UK or some sort of weird thing about that, right? And so what's interesting about that is if they were from the UK, that's part of the European Union, you could get these visas and there'd be no problem. It'd just be like NIP. Now, if on the other hand, Gambit, who remember, no one knows who runs Gambit. If we ask Edward now, he won't tell us who runs Gambit. He won't tell us what country they're based in. He won't tell us what the hierarchy is above him. Groove and the other people, we just know some shadowy cabal above Gambit somehow gets money from nowhere, including Pringles, some weird sponsorship no one's ever heard of. They pump money in. They only sponsor one team. They don't do anything except League of Legends and their one team. They just do that one team. They're not attempting to do anything else. They're not getting a Dota 2 team, CSGO team, Quake players. Yeah, nothing. StarCraft 2, nothing. They're just Gambit. And they just sponsor this one team. And so in no way am I implying that they might be from Russia with some kind of shady shit that goes on in Russia with money <laughs> coming from a source that no one knows that it'd be better if there was a public office in London that we officially broadcast there and that's why they can't visas that's i'm just going to throw it out there monty what do you think gotcha okay yeah anything to add to that edward <laughs> oh uh little english I okay yeah understand. okay we solved that part okay so there, I, th I think i've just solved the visa problem right there no one needs to ever ask about play that video clip there and then wonder what would happen if there was an ak-47 against my head right now like shut the fuck up like that's why you don't know what the visa situation is with it gambit it, okay okay gotcha but, but edward let me ask you this if Edward left Gambit and went to another team, he could essentially, hypothetically, do what Alex did, right? If he joins a team in Germany, he could get a visa and live in Germany, right? I guess, yeah. If anyone from they, not only me, everyone can join any EU teams and get visas. It's I think I don't think it's that hard. Yeah, yeah. No, like you said, anyone could join a European team and get visa. I, I think you said oh. that very clever, very clever, my man. Okay, enough said about that. Uh, right, let's move on then. Let's talk about now. So this split, we've talked about Gambit, this split. It was, it was fucking terrible. You won almost no games, and then you hey, won the, some at the end. Yeah, yeah, the end looked a lot better. Yeah, but when you have nothing to play for, and yeah, it doesn't really count, does it? Am I, am I wrong? Well, if EG I, I and Gambit... The other, okay. The, well, the other actually, teams have stuff to play for, though. If you can say, I think e and EG uh, in an A and Gambit you know, in Europe is kind of the same situation. Yeah. They're both like... Played super bad in regular season and the, in the super weeks they both played well. We finished 4 1 and I think EG finished 4 0. Yeah. I, I don't know it, what, why it happens. Is it happens because of is it nothing to lose and it's pretty much last games, just win? Or it's because just it's the synergy came just only last week, you know? So I don't know if we put this game bit now to the first week of EULCS, will we win or not? Like, there's a question. Will so, we play the same? So in the past, here's a good question for you, Edward. In the past, even if Gambit had slumps or even if teams beat Gambit, they always found a way to beat them eventually. Okay, so Rockout was beating you for a while, you beat them and you got back to the top of the league. In the previous split, you had a little slump during part of it, but then you, you, would, you always maintained the top two. You finished top two before you left Gambit. When, when this split comes around... How was Gam how was Alliance able to dominate the entire league? No one in Europe has ever just dominated the whole league, okay? On their own. How was Alliance the one team that was just that far ahead of everyone? What's your theory? Oh well. I guess it's Frog and Captain managing to uh, helping team to win. I think uh, actually I think Frogan is a, one of the smart people as well in League of Legends in Europe. Yeah. And he know what to do to win and oh so he, he's in the genja class then yeah he's one of the genja class players yeah he's one of but the genjas is... the, the five genjas the, Euro the european yeah. illuminati the yeah. lol, lol <laughs> illuminati okay. there's not much players though to say if you ask me who else i i don't even know who who else that, that good i've just realized who owns gambit genja owns gambit he's the secret <laughs> reason behind and that's why he can never be told what to build motherfucker i pay your salary 
And then that's the secret thing he says that you're like, oh, I can't argue with that. He's right. <laughs> like, Genja, please, can we get visas? I told you we're not getting visas. Oh, well, whatever you say, Genja. Yeah. So anyway, I've, one of I've got a question for you. Since you bring up Froggen and he's a smart guy and he knows how to win, people will forget this. Edward was going to play with Froggen. In fact, Edward and Alex Hitch could be on Alliance right now. Now, let, now, speaking of decisions that people have made in their lives and reflecting on those decisions, were they good decisions? Were they bad decisions? Edward says we can never know. Maybe we should speculate. What do you think would have happened if Edward and Alex Hitch had stayed in that super team, which totally didn't exist, but obviously did? Well, the super team, when we made it, yeah. it was more like Juwawa top lane, what yeah. he's playing G, G, G2 now. Uh, yeah. No, but it was Alex Hitch for a while. Well, it's mostly it was Jiwawa actually. Okay. Continue. We played all the time pretty much with him. But we played Jiwawa, Shook, me yeah. and Freeze bot lane. And we Is actually it going like, well? Yeah, we won like I think ninety five percent of screams and then it came to the point that we can't get Jiwawa from uh, TCM or yeah, what is it, it called TCM, organization? TCM yeah. yeah. And the thing that uh, we we have to play with Wicked, and I, I just didn't want to play with Wicked for yeah. some reason. I don't know, I still don't want to, but that's my okay, opinion. Okay, so that's interesting, because you so, you told me that in your interview, you said, okay, when I found out we couldn't get JWoww, and they were going to get Wicked, I didn't want to play with Wicked. Now, what's funny is most people looked at that, and they looked at the Wicked part, like, oh, he didn't want to play with Wicked. But here's the part I look at there. It's the JWoww part, because I'm like, wow, JWoww's so good, you wanted to play with him? Because JWoww... Still plays now, you know, Edward. You probably don't know this because you, you only watch Professional League of Legends. But he actually no, plays in the EU Challenger scene. He plays for a team <laughs> called Gamers 2. And uh, he's a fucking dumpster. And he's done nothing and his team's garbage. And so, am I wrong? He's really amazing top laner, right? Well, when we screamed with, with him, he was really good, actually. Uh, no, uh, but now, what, what's he like now, do you think? What about now? What, yeah, yeah. what I can say about G2 is they just lost the game and they're out of relegations now. And only what can help them if they get, like... And LCS gonna be ten teams, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's the only way they can get to the LCS. Or but I'm asking, ha have you, has your mind changed on JWoww? Like, did you just think he was good at the time? Has, like, like why is he not a, a top top player now? Do you think? I mean, you wanted him on the Alliance, right? You wanted him on the Super Team. This was a player who was really good. Were you mistaken? Did he? Did something happen to his style of play? What do you think? Well, do you think if uh, now JWoww wasn't in the Alliance except of Wicked, would have changed much? I don't. Uh -huh. Right, you say that, Edward, as though the answer is supposed to be, well, obviously not. JWoww would be awesome. I don't think yeah, me and Monty are necessarily that thinking that, is, yeah? JWoww is, like, kind of carry style player. Like, if you see Wicked, Wicked is, like, only champion what he can play aggressive, really aggressive. It's like, I think it's Irelia, right? And other champions are, like, I believe Malphite. he plays Irelia, yes. I believe the young man has been known to proffer a few Irelia games. Yeah, continue. <laughs> the other champions, he plays, like, pretty much tanky, team-wise champions. Yeah. And... But Chihuahua is like more, he, he probably like more uh, science partner style, but he's like 50-50, you know, ah, what, okay, what yeah. I like in him. He, he's playing what do you, what he have to play. Okay. And, well. I have no opinion. I've never really seen Chihuahua play, so. Okay. What, when you think back there, Edward, would, would it actually have been a good fit for you if Chihuahua had stayed and you stayed in this super team? Would it, do, you, do you feel like it would have been the right team to stay in? Was it the right I move think, to go back to Gambit? What do you think? I think we would have played the Spring Suite maybe a bit better or just the same. And uh, this split will be will be the same. We just will be number one team, I think, if if it, the super teams uh, will happen. Okay, Monty, I've actually talked to Edward a bunch in private before. We've had conversations, and so I know this is how Edward answers, okay? So I want you to take over the reins here. I want you to exp have the full Edward experience. So you've you heard these questions here. If you ask Edward, you know, Edward, what would happen if you went into Frost back when they were the champions? He'd be like, I think we'd probably have played about the same, maybe a bit better, maybe won a couple more OGN championships, probably a one Worlds. I don't want to say too much, you know? That's like the way Edward answered, okay? So I want you to try this. Try asking Edward a hypothetical and see how he would answer. Because you you got to experience it for yourself. Just go for it. Just set up anyone you want and ask him, okay? You can, it could be anyone. Okay. Go for it, yeah. All right, so if you were to roll swap to AD carry on Gambit and you would change with Genja, so Genja becomes the support, how would the results change? Like, because I'm curious, because Genja has such a specific play style that, like, I, I really wonder how this would go for you. 
actually, I asked it, even asked Genzo to play support, and I played Ikeri for some time, but he just doesn't want to try it, actually, because I think Genzo will be, like, best support in, in, in the world. He, he's just mindset. <laughs> see, see what I mean, Monty? I keep going. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Keep I going, think Genzo. the guy, Genzo is, like, super... <laughs> Uh, super good. So, so you know, have. Let me get this straight. You want Genja to shot call more, and like it's a lot easier to shot call from the support role, right? Can we agree on that? Like generally speaking, it's harder yeah. to shot call from it. Okay. And you have the potentially what you were telling me is the best support in the world, yeah. sitting there on AD carry. So why don't you make the switch? But I'm. How I know? Can I play AD carry or not? I'm. I know I have like decent mechanics, but. Uh, he's like super old. Well, I don't know? think we can. I don't think we consider Genja a mechanical god or anything like that. Yeah, Genja is kind of support player. Even he play AD carry. Actually, Genja, I, Genja playing like, You're like blowing support my mind solo. right now. <laughs> yeah, Genja playing s support in solo. Yeah, I, I can see he playing support. Like when he doesn't play AD carry, he playing Leona trash. He playing Ash support, like random shit, and he always like winning lane. I don't know how he like playing Ash support against like unrated trash. <laughs> he even he plays Ash support for fuck's sake. <laughs> Does he build tier on as well as support? First no, item he just, tier. He just he just goes side stone, around doing some Ash, okay. and I don't know Doran shield. And Zephyr. Shit. Zephyr, does he need to kite no, when he's playing his I don't know, support? he's just building random items. And actually, <laughs> sometimes you want to ask Genja, what do you think will be good to me to build on this champion? Or I don't know. He's like good at, at this point. Any, can you think of another good hypothetical one? Okay, I've got one for you. <laughs> we take the CLG lineup, like you were talking about before, Ed, Edward. The CLG lineup, Hotshot GG, Boy Boy. Was it that one? Yeah, Voivod, Chorster, Double Lift, and their problem was they had Loco Doco, who wasn't very, playing very well as a support player. Now we take Loco Doco out, we put Edward onto that lineup. Classic season two Edward, Ignite, <laughs> Sona, Threat. Well, Thresh wasn't out then, but you, you know these champions. What would that lineup be like, Edward? In the COG? Yeah. I don't know. I I was thinking the COG sucks at times, so I don't think it would happen much. Even you could. I, I, I didn't like the time NA at all, you know. Why? I was what do you, what do you think like... it was? What was weak about NA, or what was different about NA that wasn't good enough? Mm, it's not so different. I think like NA teams was not taking serious the big tournaments, and that's just it. I was thinking they're not taking it serious. For me, like season two, it was like everything, you know. No, I don't. Please tell me. What are you? I, I was just playing season two to, to just to win the world. That was my goal. And okay. for me, I was always thinking for some reason that NA players playing uh, league competitive to just make money. That was what I was thinking all the time. Because every time I see they play in international tournaments, they're just I don't know like bronze people. But when it comes to when you see it right now, NA is like way professional at this point. Like they're getting like uh, players from Korea, Europe. You can see like playing way way better than Europe. I can say now. What do you think of the his analysis of season two, Monty? Oh, I think it was just a lot looser time in the scene in general. I mean, even in Korea at that point, like the gaming houses is kind of just like just started not too long ago. Uh, there wasn't the same level of coaching. Like the big infrastructure players hadn't like like gotten into place yet. Uh, so it's. And then, of course, like the Kespa teams came along and provided all the money and infrastructure, and now we're still trying to catch up in the West. And uh, I do think that Europe has been lagging a little bit behind on that, despite being what I think a fundamentally more talented region. And I think we can say that because, you know, we in NA like steal all the, the EU players, you know? <laughs> and uh, just watching, you know, I, I've been watching some of the EU like Challenger Series matches, and there does seem to be some, some talent there. So, um, Whereas I watch NA Challenger matches from time to time, and I do not think that is true. Very, very yeah, much. I actually think the EU Challenger is way better than NA Challenger, yeah, it's, but it's NA top teams is better than EU team top teams, I think. Whoa, 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 hmm, whoa, interesting. Whoa, 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 whoa. Please define what you mean by NA top teams. Mm, I just think the top five in NA is like, yeah. at some point, better than top five in Europe. That's all I think. Like, if I. Just, just uh, overall. I think I think top five in NA are are on average better than top five in Europe, but I think top two in Europe are better than top two in NA. Mm, yeah, you can. Yeah, I, I agree with that. 
What do you think you of LMP, what it, Edward? In, in NA, like top five teams is CLG, like, not compared like CLG first. CLG, TSM, uh, LMQ, Dignitas, but they fall behind a bit now. Yeah. And uh, let me open low Sports. Well, I, I mean, if we're, if we're being technically accurate, Curse is in the top five there, but you know, I know what you mean. <laughs> most of the season, yeah, yeah most if, of the season, that was the see, top five. If, if you see the teams in Europe, like there is an Alliance, Fnatic, yeah. then going Super Hot Crew, Millennium, Escape, uh, SK, yep. and. That's the five. Yeah. For some reason, yeah. From my perspective, I think just the support crew millennium is like, I don't know, not comparable to top five, uh, to top, to, okay. top, another top teams in NA. But how like, does they, Alliance and Fnatic compare to the top five in NA? Well, I think Fnatic Alliance is like better team. Uh, yeah, be better than uh, NA. In what respect? Uh, what do you think teams. they're better than? Mm, just better players, better, I don't know, just better team. Okay. Do you Actually, think that Alliance and Fnatic can win Worlds? Um, it's a hard question because I don't think they can win, but they can get like really far to the standings and they can go to playoffs, definitely. Yeah. But I think uh, Alliance is not going to go. Four. They can make top four with the right bracket. I think Fnatic will make top four but not alliance why? i think alliance will struggle with worlds why if they go just because they is it they never played in international like shook uh he's gonna be yeah, he's, he's, the gonna play who, play. he's the only one who hasn't played in international though yeah and if you you think Shook's, if, okay so is shook gonna do what shook has done in the past where he plays well and then he gets to a big playoff game and that's where he does badly is that what you're trying to say yeah i think he's gonna play like uh the Lemon Dogs did last year. Right, okay. I think they're gonna finish like with Lemon Dogs in last year, pretty much, yeah. Hmm, okay. They're all gonna, yeah, they're probably gonna, not gonna go out of worlds, out of group stage. When people hmm. are looking at the EU Challenger scene and they see that NIP might be top three there, and then they look at LCS and they say, ooh, Gambit's bottom two, they're like, hmm, some EU Challenger teams are gonna play versus some. LCS teams in relegation matches. What if NIP was to play Gambit? So I put that to you, Edward. What if NIP was to play Gambit in the relegation match? Well, I think there's no chance for NIP to win, actually. At least uh, what is NIP right now. Yeah, yeah. Why? Mm. What, I, what I think, in my opinion, like, Voidal is not the support the freeze need. I think I think okay, freeze is yeah. really great AD carry, but uh, Waddle is not the support uh, freeze need. What does he um, need? What type of support do you think he needs? Sort of stocky guy, maybe from like Omsk, uh, <laughs> alien from Armenia. Yeah, perhaps. Actually, I think I will be way better than Waddle in NIP, but okay, well, what, that's not happening. Okay, but here's the problem: Voidle's only recently joined NIP. They used to have a guy who was very well rated. He's called Mithy. Was he the sort of support that? Need yeah, Mithy is also the kind of support Freezy need, and I think also in Rated is kind of support Freezy would like to have. Yeah. Uh, who else? Mm, I guess that's it. Even I, I, don't, I don't think even Yozer is kind of support Freezy need. But okay. what kind of support does he need? Like, mm, more like laner in that support. Yeah. Not uh, team fight, but if it's both so it's even even better hmm. okay so so i think i think voidal is like one of the weakest support in challenger series on the lane he's doing like crazy shit sometimes but overall in teamfights he, he can do really well so one of the reasons why people set up that scenario okay what if ah my monitor just turned off okay it's back again what if Gambit met Nip is obviously because they want to know what would it be like for Gambit or Alexich to have knock each other out. What what do you actually think about that? Would you like to knock Alexich out and be like, listen, mm. you left us and now you're <laughs> back and now I get to decide your fate and Lord Edward has spoken, you will not be in the LCS. Back it's kind of fucked up you. if I want to do that, but uh, Alex is a really close guy to me oh, yeah. and we're still friends okay we even played like yeah. i think we even played duo queue today like uh well, on that's, gonna, that's gonna be an awkward duo queue the day after that relegation match that's all i'm saying 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I actually want to see Alex in LCS, but is there any opportunity, any chance that we're gonna meet Alex in relegations and he have to play another half a year in the Challenger Series? Okay, fair enough. Okay, let me ask you this question. The, the thing is, uh, Alex moved to top lane. It's really like really bad for him. He yeah. didn't pretty much. He started playing mid lane after he back to mid, like from the beginning. Uh, if you compare Alex now and Alex was, he was in playoffs. He went in playoffs. He was fucking good. He played so good in the, all yeah, the he matches. Did. He, yeah, I mean, he kind of saved you guys. Yeah, exactly. If you compare Alex in the playoffs and Alex now, it's like two 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 different Alexes. Yeah, like what else I can say? Like truth. And the uh, guys, I think the Cabo, Cabo chart and the junglers they they will have or Lulex or yeah Lulex now who left an IP. It's they're gonna play way worse than in in offline tournaments and in online. They're like solo queue players both and. Cowboy Chat was pretty much in our team. We screamed with him a lot. He's playing way too good in online. He's like, I don't know, he's, he was beating everyone. We even scream when Darren was in game as well. We scream against uh, NIP and Cowboy Chat was beating him so much. Like, I think eight of out of 10 games. But when it comes to the tournament and uh, he's choking a lot, or I don't know how to say. So I think it's gonna be same for Lulix. Earlier in the conversation, Monty made a statement that to anyone watching is just, you know, it's, it's almost a redundant statement. He said, no one would say that Darien is a top three top laner in the world. I, Edward, what does Edward think of Darien? Well, I think, uh, I'm going to think a bit. Yeah. Darien is... The thing is, Darien, you know, right? Darien was... God of top laners at the season two, right? you know what? You know why, right? Because the thing that people don't, people were so naive. They didn't know how they can like uh, Darren go just behind the creeps, like uh, farm there, go proxy enemy jungle, farm, yeah. yeah, proxy farm. No one just understand what is it. He just go at the I am Kiev. He went to enemy blue buff, solo blue buffs, and uh, TP back to lane and run to top lane with blue buff. Uh, so people just don't understand that uh, they didn't know you can do that stuff, and that's why Darren was super good at, at this point. And now you can expect what, like so much different things from from us. Like you can expect P5 people going to bar Dragon Pit level one, flash over the wall, go some do invade crazy shit, and uh, what is people expecting from everything? Like, so it's for for Darren is way worse to play now. He's like cheesy player, I can say. What do you think of Darian, Monty? I think that he was incredibly innovative for his time, uh, just like a lot of the Moscow Five, but I think once people caught up, he, uh, and there were a lot more kind of minds going into what to do in the scene that he uh, couldn't, he just can't innovate at the same pace because there's way too, the competition is so much fiercer these days. Um, and so he kind of fell off and I don't think he's really like that, high quality. I do remember, especially at IEM Cam, I mean, what a brilliant tournament. It's like a classic, like, uh, Moscow 5 Gambit moment. Um, playing Shivana, just... Yeah, playing Shivana, just like yeah. farming enemy jungle all the time. I mean, that's, that was a fantastic tournament. Um, and, yeah, it, it's just, like, people have figured out the game to a degree that that level of innovation I don't feel is really possible anymore. If Edward wasn't here on this episode, and we were talking now about Gambit, I would just ask Monty, I'd say, okay, Gambit just had a terrible split this time. They might get relegated, they might stay in. They probably have to change players, right, Monty? That's what we would say, and we'd go, you know, which players should they change, or who could they get out, and who would they get in? If I was asking you that, Monty would probably say, remove Darian and Genja, right? Well, they're not in team. I mean, if if Genja if Genja is so central to the shot calling, and they they if what Edward says is true that they're trying to adjust in order to allow Genja to shot call more, and that has been part of their success at the end of the split, and the reason why they they've been winning more games in the last couple of weeks, um, then I would say probably cutting Genja is not the right move. Uh, I think removing Darian is is good. I don't know if necessarily Kuban is the the you know the right player to replace him. Um, but yeah, I, I would say probably cutting Darian is is 
pretty high up there. I think getting rid of Diamond is not not a good idea, especially with his recent performance. Because that's the problem, right? Is that first of all, if you remove someone, you're not really just removing them like they're just a problem on their own. But we can get someone way better. Because if you do it during the middle of LCS, you can't. Okay, you have to get whoever's left over in the challenger scene who will join your team who isn't going to automatically get into LCS themselves. So then it leaves a scenario where. Really, I want to teleport forwards a month and have this conversation where Gam Gamut's relegated or not, and then we know at that point, okay, do they get someone different? At which point, there's all these free agents and all the teams they can choose from and ask to join them. Now, Edward can't tell us that they're going to cut Gary and we should do it because Darian's still in the team and they still have to play games. But if I asked Monty if they removed Darian, that would be the move, right? If you could get a player who was good, that's like that would seem like the right move going forwards. Yep. So also, if you compare uh, Kubon and Darian, I will still go, still go for Kubon. Even he is not that uh, good mechanically as Darian, but he's still like going even on lane as, as a score. He, he, maybe he's behind in creeps, like 20, 30 creeps every game uh, in LCS, but he's still getting 0 0. He's doing really good teleports. He's like always timing enemy TP, what Darian never does. Uh, he always uh, in time on Dragon. He always can like. Her bottom lane. Darian never times enemy TP. No. Why? Did I think we? He's got to. He's got to go, it. man. He's got to go. <laughs> there was man, much I, thinker. He, I don't he even just know never said like. That. Like the thing is when we like if we can see like enemy top lane TPing to us to Genja and we're like yelling Darian, Darian TP TP. He like oh wait I don't have TP guys don't worry I am pushing top and like it's like getting super annoying at this point. See I love European guests because what happens is every time I get to see Monty truly experience like confusion like w w w I don't understand like what, is he saying what I think he's saying and so I'll give you an example Monty you said that as though like what a ridiculous thing how could he not be timing the enemy teleport what if I told you that Edward has been playing support all these years, being doing amazingly and having all these top placings at lands, and he hasn't been timing shit from the enemy team. Summoners, <laughs> nothing. And, I, and I, he's even told me, I once said to him, you know, I heard that in Korea, you will get really criticized if you're not timing all the enemy stuff. And he, Edward told me, yeah, but what would the point be? Let's say the enemy times my flash, and he, you know, he knows that I flashed, then I'll kill him. And he comes into lane again and he thinks I don't have flash. So he goes on me and I'll just kill him again. <laughs> Monty, what do you think of this? This is an elite level player in Europe who is winning tournaments, placing Hall What do you think, Monty? You gotta just give me just give me what you're thinking right now. Yeah, it actually uh, is true. <laughs> yeah, the, the most the most depressing part about that is now you just wonder how good these players could have been if they had actually, you know, had a little more discipline in the game, because obviously you guys did really well, but how much better could you have been? You know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I don't know. I didn't give a shit about timing at the time. <laughs> I was like, the time was I was playing Sona, I just people coming to my lane, I just shit on them. They going back, coming back, I shit on them. It was pretty much uh, like almost all the games. But that's the worst mentality to have. It's like, well, I'm shitting on them, so I might as well just not do this other thing. Yeah. Don't you want to shit on them even harder? Like, oh, what is wrong with you? Yeah. Monty, it's like someone asked him, is is uh, is Thresh's is Thresh's flash up? Who cares? I'm shitting on him. And if he comes back, I'll shit on him again. <laughs> no, but I want to come and gank bot lane. Don't bank bot lane. I'm shitting on him. Like that's really what they were playing like. But it's only that I didn't, I didn't time much flashes, but I always time it the uh, dragons and uh, all the buffs in the on the map. But I didn't time much the buffs. I mean the flashes. Okay. So. And the ultimate. Maybe you should start doing that. Were... Did you what? time the ultimates of the enemy? Oh, team? I'm doing, I'm doing it right now. So. Did you time the okay. ultimates of the enemy team? That's good. It makes me feel better. <laughs> I'm doing it for like more than a year. So. Did you oh, time okay, the okay, ultimates good. of the enemy team? Ultimates of enemy team? Yeah. I wish I have. I know how much the cooldowns of them. So. Did you just I hear can't... that, Monty? You remember in like <laughs> fucking March of 2013 when people were like, you know, Mad Life knows the cooldowns of every enemy ultimate, like. Edward's like, know, Edward in 2014 is like, it'd be great to know some of those cooldowns. That'd probably be really useful, but we'll never know, I guess. The information's gone out there. I'm trying to shit on people. I'm too busy right now. Excuse me. How you can know the timing on cooldowns if you... Yeah. You, you can get like cooldown reductions like yeah, yeah. you can just time 10 seconds wrong and you I get mean, fucked up with it. I mean you could always learn yeah, what those my, items my do and look in the item thing and go oh he's got I, cooldown reduction. I mean, the secret though as usual is Time Lord Genja because he knows automatically he lives in the future so he knows when the summoners are coming up there's no need for timers right. <laughs>
Well, I, actually, it's so it's actually not that hard to time flashes and stuff like uh, right now, because exactly. Much, so why didn't you do it? I'm doing it. Good. But you, you know weren't. what? You know when LCS first started, they brought in that system from like NBA games when they do broadcasts on national television, where there'll be like the three keys to the game for this team to win. And it would always be like something really generic, you know, like if it's basketball, it'll be like, you know, keep the tempo slow, like make sure this player gets involved, like try and keep turnovers under, t you know, something simple like that. I imagine that for Gambit, it was like Edward shits on an enemy in lane. If if you lose track of the summoners, don't worry, just shit on them in lane again. And then the end, it's like... <laughs> Genja does whatever he wants. Like those are the three keys for Gambit to win. Yeah. Did you just have like this notebook? Did like Groove just like hand you a piece of paper that just says like shit on them and like that's it? That was the game plan. <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't have like even. Yeah, we don't have that, sh that stuff. We just every time we go to the game, uh, all what we have pretty much is like most of the times like plan for the early game, but in late game we're just doing. I don't know we're deciding in the in the game pretty much. So. <laughs> it's the part where it's the it's the part where he sort of like incredulously said like, but they could have cooldown reduction. How could I know the timing of the cooldown? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the way he sort of suggests like, but who could know those things, Monty? These things cannot be known. Like, <laughs> you live but in you another world, Genja. But, uh, but you don't think about it. If you, if I guess I can go play like Sona and I get like uh, five percent cooldown reduction and uh, offensive tree, and I get like cooldown reduction runes and the enemy like mid life time of my ultimate for like two minutes, but my ultimate is like one minute forty seconds, and I just flash him like twenty seconds earlier and he dies. Like, right? <laughs> That's the most ludicrous thing. I don't even. I don't even know what that setup, the, the premise was. You there. can just say it because again. it's true. D describe it back to me again. I, I was laughing too much. D tell, tell me at the beginning again. Yeah, mad life, timing your cooldown for two minutes. Yeah. Forget about it. No, tell me. I, listen, I think I feel like there was something that I missed. Just tell me it again, please, Edward. Mad life is does what? Well, I have cooldown reduction for like ten percent, right? Yeah. I have like my ultimate comes like faster for like ten or twenty seconds, right? Yeah. So my life, my life's time, my ultimate for like two minutes, yeah. but my, I have like ten percent cooldown reduction. So my ultimate gonna be like in one minute forty. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna flash on him like twenty seconds earlier, and he not gonna expect it, right? Yeah. He's like type it in chat. Okay. Uh, Sono ultimate like seven twenty, right? But I'm gonna yeah. flash on him seven o'clock. Like, okay. Uh, here's, so, my, yeah. here's my counter for you. Are you ready? One. Yeah. How would you know that Mad Life knows that it's two minutes later? And then two. Why? Why would that be better than him not knowing at all when it came up? Well, there's a point. You don't have to time ultimate. Okay. But I mean, so the I, whole point is they used to use the ultimate timing to attack like five minute, five seconds before the ultimates came up. Well. What do you think of that? Sounds like a good idea, right? If you could attack the enemy team in team fights five seconds before their cooldown came up. If you're 100 percent sure, yes, you can do it. But it's if you're not 100 percent sure, you can. Like, I mean, Gambit had their own philosophy. What they would do is they would attack the enemy team in a team fight. Just because they wanted to attack the enemy team, like they had their own philosophy going forwards, you know. Wasn't you know you can debate which is better. Okay, getting out of this side topic we've gotten drawn into here. What we've do got a lot to talk about, man. Yeah, yeah. So going into the uh, playoffs, and we only have forty-five minutes. Yeah. So. Edward, Edward is not in the playoffs, so he can just give us the straight up, the raw shit on who's going to win these playoffs because we're going to do the predictions now. Okay, so if we Fanatic go into four-time champions. <laughs> So EU oh. LCS now, Edward. We have SK Gaming versus Millennium. Who's gonna win and why? Okay, I think uh, there's Millennium gonna win it for sure. It's best of five, it... remember? What? It's best of five, remember? Yeah, it's even better for Millennium. Okay, why? Because they played more best of five. They play way too much relegations. That's an interesting way to look at it. Okay. So, but they also, I think the SK is like way worse now than before, and I think the SK members don't have that mentality. They they can just lose a lot of games uh, in the season, and then just change the mentality and like, okay, now we have to win, and they just get all shit together and uh, go to playoffs and uh, crush everyone. I don't think that the team because if I if I'm not wrong, they lost the. Uh, pretty much the finals against Fnatic last uh, last spring, last yeah. spring, uh, pretty much.
pretty much on purpose, right? Because they didn't want to go to All Stars, even if they. Can I win. don't really know if they did do that, but they they say. I that, think yeah, it, sure. uh, pretty much no. I mean, the Candy Panda said something like that. They didn't really want to win the. Dude, playoffs. first place was like twenty k extra. Yeah. So what? <laughs> So they lost. They, they, I was they... not playing for that, okay? <laughs> okay, bro. Whatever. whatever. Yeah. So, Monty, who do you think is going to win that matchup? SK Gaming versus Millennium. Best of five. I think Millennium. I I think they're on a better trend right now, generally speaking. Uh, SK has just looked weak uh, ever since like we've gone back into a 2v2 and 1v1 meta. And I think that they're... They just haven't had the strongest laners. So, I have to, I have to give the edge to Millennium right there. See, the thing yeah. is, I'm really torn on that one because on the on one hand, I think Millennium have like much more skilled players. And so there's a potential to, for them to just blow SK away. But I actually think right. the hidden factor, I'm going to go with SK winning that series. And this is my reasoning why. They have a decent amount of time to practice just for Millennium. And I think their team would benefit more from preparation than a team like Millennium would anyway. So I think that can even the gap up. So I, I could be wrong on this, but I think that they'll come up with something and that they'll have an approach that could win. I don't think, it, I think either Millennium wins massive or SK just edges it. So I'm going to go with SK edging that series. Any, any the thoughts? Thing is, the thing is, uh, if you're playing best of five, it's the time almost gives you nothing because you play two games and then it's like nothing new for from the team. Okay. Or just you're playing one, pretty much first game always in best of five is almost like playing uh, same stuff. Yeah. What they used to play, right? And then if they if if the, if the team lose, uh, they are starting to show some new stuff, and if they win, they playing the same, right? Right. Well, when you say that, let me just stop you right there because I like that opinion, and now I'm gonna just put this in some context and pass it over to Monty. So Monty, you heard that opinion there about best of five. Edward has played one best of five in his whole career, and all OGN does is play best of fives in the playoffs, and we get the sense that pre preparation really helps in best of five. So I'll pass that over to you now. What do you think? I think that, well, I mean, preparation does really help in a best of five because you have to have more than one strategy. Sometimes in a best of threes, you can get away with running the same strategy to get two wins, but it's really rare against a good team or a team that you're like authentically better than for that strategy to work three times to win three games. So it requires you to come in with a, a pretty big uh, playbook of different compositions, different styles in order to use against your opponent. So I think it's a much better determin uh, determin determining factor in terms of uh, who is the better team. And it's really sad that you've only played in one best of five ever. I have to say that because I, I really enjoy the best of five format. I don't actually remember when I did play that. The final of LCS Spring Split. First oh, yeah, one. right, against Fnatic. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, actually, I know the KTB is one of the best teams of best of five. They really adapting fast to the to the team in Korea, right? They old key KTB. Uh, yeah. I mean, SKT did, like KTB in the finals, they went up two games with some specific strategies, and then SKT K figured it out. Yeah. Had it been a best of three, that finals would have been 2-0 KT Bullets. Um, yep. And there are a lot of series like that where I think the better team has come out after uh, adapting to a strategy because there's there's the ad there's the adaptation. So like SKTK had to adapt to the bullets and then the bullets had three games to try and adapt back, but they couldn't do it. So, you know, there's always that like give and take in the best of five, which I find very interesting. Um, so yeah, it's a it's an awesome format. And you know what's interesting actually is uh, since we've been here, a lot of the Korean teams actually scrim in best of fives. Um, in NA, typically we have a like two hour block or something like that. Um, but in Korea, it's like you just start and then the, the scrim lasts however long it lasts in a best of five, which also means that you don't, you know, you don't want to quit the game. Like if your level one goes wrong, like a, a lot of NA and EU teams are like, burp, GG, we're just going to restart. Uh, that doesn't yeah. happen. You like the Korean teams, even if they're getting, you know, even if it's like a really one sided game, they will play it out until like the bitter, bitter end. Um, it's, in, it's in, Europe, in Europe, mainly playing best of three, actually. Okay, the other matchup. Yeah, do you have something, Edward? No, no. Okay, the okay. other matchup is Super Hot Crew versus Rockat. Who's going to win it, Edward? This area is going to be Rockat. Actually, the thing I was thinking that two worlds is going to be like three teams. 
Well, um, I'm pretty sure of that. So yeah, who are they going to be? Yeah, I mean the <laughs> the two teams you know is going to be like sure. probably Alliance at Fnatic, and okay, well the third team is going to be or Rocket or Millennium, I think, because I think Super Hot Crew and uh, SK are not going to prepare that well. That and actually not maybe they're going to prepare well, but I don't think they're going to play that good that they were used to be. Okay, so for, for for the majority of the season, Super Hot Crew was doing much better than Rocket. What makes you so confident in Rocket? Yeah, Rocket is like a kind of fanatic style team. They, the early seasons, they don't give a fuck about the games, and okay, yeah. when it comes to the almost the middle or a bit later in the split, okay, yeah. and they start playing way better. Like you can see, like Rocket have like seven or eight win win speed or something, and same for Fnatic yeah. pretty much. And I, I don't think the teams are gonna just give up at the last moment. Okay, I'm glad you described it like that because I held my breath for a second there when you said that Rocket is kind of a team like Fnatic because I was thinking Fnatic, all stars at every position, amazing skill level, just incredible ability in the game, and then I thought Rocket. But yeah, but I'm not saying the players is the same. I'm saying the, yeah, I, the I know same. You, you were using just that as the the reference point. Okay, I understand how you're doing it. So, what, who does Monty have winning that series? Super Hot Crew or Rocket? I don't think you even care, but just try and pretend like you do. Just, <laughs> just put your game face on. Imagine you're talking about Mineski versus like Vulcan right now, and then just, just give me give me the analysis. Monty tries <sighs> furiously to care about EU LCS. <laughs> uh I think Rocket has picked it up towards the end of the season, and uh, I do think that also Rocket has been on the forefront of, of picking up some really strong champions. I mean, they were really the, the kind of the first uh, EU team, well, their first team really to bring out the Maokai, top Maokai in competitive play, like Zaxxus, and that's been a really powerful pick, and they also have been working a lot with Zareth, which is pretty powerful as well. So I, I have to give it to them just because I feel purely that they've been more innovative, and I think they can bring some unique strategies to, to like a best of five. Because here's the interesting thing again, I'm actually going to disagree with both of my experts here. You're both picking Rocket, I'm going to pick Super Hot Crew, and here's why. I actually think that matchup is really interesting, because the strengths of the teams are at totally different positions. In theory, Super Hot Crew has all the good laners, the good AD carry, decent mid laner, good top laner. Meanwhile, in Rocket, you have the good jungler and the good support, they're the best players. So you actually have no no matchup that's like really super interesting there. So I actually think that Super Hot Crew will win just by being better team, just more skilled players, they'll win. And so I, okay, Rocket, I put them in the position of SK I did before, like they can prepare more maybe, better strategy, but I, don't, I think they're gonna lose for sure. So I think, it, I think amazingly, Super Hot Crew's going to the semis. So, just my opinion. You can, you can. But, but where is the connection? If you're saying yeah. Super Hot Crew got best uh, better players, but it doesn't mean they're yeah. a better team. No, no. But if I wanted to carry the game, I wouldn't want to do it from only the jungle and support position. I'd rather do it with all the laners that the game's designed around carrying the game. Okay. What do you mean? You can't just say it like that in a meek and mild manner. Oh, okay. Yeah, fuck you. Then that's what you think. Yeah, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Like you wanted to disagree. You had, you had some reason why you thought I was wrong there. Come on, tell me. Enlighten Probably. me. Why am I wrong here, Edward? I don't know. I just, I just know the Rocket is way better teams than Super Hot Crew. Okay. Super Hot Crew, of course, they have like way, way better skill at me laner. Yeah. Uh, they have... I, I think they they have better AD carry, yep. but well, I don't, I don't think, think that's even de fucking debatable, is it? Come on. Yeah, but I don't think the Super Hot Crew is better overall than no, Rocket. Yeah. They're, they're close teams, obviously that's why they're matching up here. Okay, Edward, let's just, on a side topic, sidebar, we'll do a little bet. And if Super Hot Crew beats Rocket, you have to refer to me on Twitter as Lord Thorin. You have to message me on Twitter and say Lord Thorin was right in this bet. And if you win, if Rockat wins, I'll message and say Lord Edward was right and Rockat won. You, you want this bet? You want to take this bet with me? I'm done. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. It's, it's witness. There it's, you go. It's, 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 it's a lot less serious than Loco Doko's bet where he's going to have to call us Lord Thorne and Lord Monty for a year I mean, when TSM doesn't yeah, get that, first place. That one's already done. So we've already got that one in the bank money. I'm just trying to get more people to call me Lord at this point. Okay. So me and Edward are doing the gamble here. Okay. <laughs> So going forwards, we have you guys have Millennium and Rocket going forwards in the playoffs. Hmm. Who are they gonna meet actually? I, I Alliance don't SK Millennium winner plays Alliance and Super Hot Crew Rocket player plays for that. So let's ask it this way. 
what are the, what is the bracket like for Alliance? Is SK and Millennium the better draw than Rockout and uh, Superhot Crew for them in the semi final? Who, who's going to meet Alliance? SK Millennium winner. Oh, okay. Is that the is that a good bracket draw for Alliance compared to if they'd got the other side? I mean, Alliance is three and one against everybody, so I think it really doesn't matter who Alliance gets. Uh, yeah. I think they've shown they lose to themselves, like mostly. So I think they're capable, like it's obviously been shown that they're capable of losing to any team in the league. So I would say that it doesn't matter for Alliance. They're going to make the finals. Like, okay. it's fine. What do you think, Edward? Oh, I think it's a really good bracket for Alliance and it's going to be no problem for them if they're going to meet Millennium or SK. Because the thing is, for the Alliance one, I understand that. Like, actually, Alliance has been so good, it almost doesn't matter who they play. But I actually think it's Fnatic who got the good end of the bracket. Because Fnatic getting support crew and Rockart, I can't see any way those teams can beat Alliance. Yeah, yeah, Fnatic. yeah. Whereas actually, yeah. who knows, maybe Millennium could have. I, I don't think it's likely, but I think they would have had a better chance versus Fnatic in a best of five. What do you think, Edward? Well, I, Millennium always have like, I don't know how, but they always have play them Blitzcrank and shit and somehow win games against Alliance. So, mm, how to say? Like Millennium is a team like you can, sh team can surprise anybody. I think, like even we play against Millennium, uh, the split, and I think the the most scary team for us. All the time we play against Millennium, and we're not like, oh holy shit, what are we gonna get, do against Kerb? They get like unstoppable, even we just even more scared than Frogan. Uh, so I think Millennium can can try to do something against the Lions because they get. Wait wait wait, wait 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 what. Why is Kerp more scary for you than Froggen? You mean if you were in a horror movie and you know when like you hear something you think it's the killer but it's just a cat. So you guys are going mm. around. Oh my god, is that Kerp behind? Oh, it's just Froggen. So, it's just, just Froggen. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah, why, is, why is Kerp more scary than Froggen for, for Gambit? I don't know. The, the thing with... Uh, I used to talk with Genja about it. Yeah. That we talk like who do we want to who, who, with, with what team we deserve to play actually when we play against Milano we're just getting stumped all the time but when we're playing against Alliance it's like more like quiet game for some reason and so it's, it's like easier to play against them and Froggen used to play lately like with champions like uh, used to play with champions like Lulu, Twisted Fate like what is like not hard carries but Kerb just play some Leblanc fees and shit so it's like way harder to play for us Okay, fair enough. Okay, we've done EU LCS. There's no point actually doing NA because it's a couple of weeks ago. We might as well do that when that comes up. So right. we'll just wrap up with Edward now and then Edward can leave and me and Monty will just finish up on Korea and then that can be the end of the show. No, I mean, Edward watches Korea. So I think like maybe he wants to talk about Korea. I know you he's really into Korean Korea, law. Edward? Mm, if no. you do, come on, do it. I actually didn't watch much lately. Yeah, there Korea. we go. Okay. I, I tried to only, save you from yourself there, Edward, but... I only watch it, like, a bit NLB matches. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think I even watched the the last... The matches was yesterday, right? No, no. Or I mean, who's got ago? time for this shit? Cool, so, you know, timing cooldowns, talking to your teammates, watching LGN. You know, there's stuff to do. You've got things to do. Yep. Okay, so let's wrap, let's wrap up the topic. I've got a question for you here, Edward. Right now you're in Gambit, if everything goes awesome and you win, maybe you stay with Genja, maybe the whole team stays the same, maybe you go into the next split, maybe things are awesome, la la la, maybe things all go amazing, who can say all those vague things that we're supposed to do instead of analysis, but in my world, if I look at Edward's career right now, okay, I can understand when Alexic left, you wanted someone who could speak Russian, so you had to go for someone like Neek, someone maybe not so known, because there's not many Russian speakers who are good at League of Legends, but now, we live in a world where you have Kubon, you had you had a French guy as your jungler. In theory, Gambit can now have English language speakers. So now there's no reason in the future why Gambit can't get better players if they want. So is there a world in which Edward is playing with Freeze as his AD carry? He's playing with Forgiven as his AD carry. You just go and you get the best English language speaking free agents and you make a super Gambit team. Is this, is this even possible? Uh... I think it's possible because there is a month uh, until the relegations, and I think it can change a lot. But but we're gonna play at least for now with the roster we finished playing uh, LCS. Yeah, sure. 
Have but you ever thought to yourself, though, like, you know, what would it be like if I could play with some of these talented, you know, free agents or players who aren't in LCS? Like, like, could I make a new Gambit? Has that ever been considered for Gambit in the future? Of course, I'm always thinking, uh, what can I do to be in better situation in the standings or something? So I always think about the stuff, but the main goal is to, at least for now, to do the best uh, what we have now. Okay. It, uh, Gambit. Another hypothetical. Again, if Gambit, if everything goes fine, Edward just stays with his team and that's all perfectly fine as a scenario. But let's imagine, for some reason, Gambit got knocked out in relegation match. Okay. Would Edward stay in Gambit? Or if he got an offer, would he try and join another LCS team? What, what's your sense, do you think? This I is think a world where Gambit we, isn't in LCS, remember, yeah? I think if we lose the relegation, I'm probably... If I got invited to any another team in LCS, I'm probably going to join it. Are like, you someone I, where... Like, okay, Alexic went into Challenger. He said, I can play in Challenger for a season. Nukedok stayed in Challenger, even though he had offenses in LCS. These people said, okay, I don't mind playing in Challenger. Would For Edward, you have to be in LCS if you're going to keep playing League, right? No, well, actually, why should like player like consider playing Challenger? It's like, so retarded. If you can, if you have a chance to play LCS, you have to ab abuse the chance. Uh, or you, you can, if you, like, if Alex now left the LCS, now is the chance where he will never join LCS again. I'm pretty sure if he mm -hmm. loses relegation, no one will invite him to join any team, right? To LCS, probably. No, it's the freeze curse. We've already seen that. He's already been entangled in that. Okay, yeah, do, you have, do you have any? Yeah. I think if you if you're LCS player, you have to just keep playing that LCS. No, I agree with you. I think it's retarded when these players leave and don't go back. Because even if they think they're getting a better scenario, really you're gambling that your scenario will be better in six months when you can requalify. And as we've seen, every single fucking time these teams break apart or they choke in the next, you know, like it's actually a huge gamble, bigger than it seems. So if I was yeah. them, I would, like, I'm not even joking. If I was Alex Sitch and Forgiven and Freeze, I would have just joined, gone and joined the bad LCS teams. Like if I was Alex Sitch, I'd now be the mid laner of fucking Super Hot Crew or something. And if I was Nuke Doc, I'd have gone and joined Copenhagen Wolves. And if I was Forgiven, I'd have just stayed in Copenhagen. You know, I'd, I'd rather play the season out and then upgrade from an LCS spot than go to Challenger and risk not even getting back in again. What do you think on the topic is a hypothetical? Yeah. Of course, you better play in bad LCS team, but if you're a good player, everyone will see that you're, you're doing way better than you're, you support. I think, I mean, the you have to be in better teams than you used, you used to be now. So sure. you're just what playing one season in bad team, getting like pretty much top six or something, and then you're getting picked up by another team who, who you deserve. What do you think, Monty? Because like I said, when I named these examples, these are players who are good enough definitely get on in LCS teams. They definitely get offers, but they've, you know, for different reasons by a person. What do you think in a general idea of not just staying in LCS, even if you're on a bad team, you know? Uh, oof. I mean, I think that it's, I think it's better if you feel that there are opportunities uh, to get back into LCS within one split and you're in a bad team environment or there's a you know really big uh, attitude issues or that you feel that this team will never actually be able to place above like uh, seventh or eighth place in the LCS and therefore could be easily relegated, especially if you move to an, an amateur team, then it probably is the right move. Okay. Do you have any final words, Edward, before we ask you to politely hang up and go and face your teammates who you said you might cut and have to leave from and all that good shit, and Darian? Uh, do you have any final words, Edward? It's lovely having uh, you on I the think, show. I think I'm done with this. It's yeah, pretty yeah. good. Thanks for coming on, man. Thank you to inviting me. Oh, yeah, it's okay. At least I can improve my English a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Okay, spasiba. Yeah, yeah spasiba. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay, so now we'll do the Korea segment. We only have a, a bit of time, but then again, we don't have tons of games to cover. So, last time we covered the round of eight, and now we're up to... The finals. Yeah. Okay, so the semi-finals. Monty, you hyped Katie Arrows all, well, let's face it, like two seasons, but we, we'll just give you credit for this season because we know it ended last time. Blaze crushed him. This season around, <laughs> things were going great. They got past Blaze. You know, the, the mark of champions, obviously. They got to the playoffs. They had the slumping Najin Shield. You know, they were going to crush them. They didn't. They just nudged past them. But okay, don't worry. Here comes SKTS. A joke of a team. The worst, I said, the worst team to ever make an OGN semi final. I don't think, that, I think that's a controversial statement. How I the fuck that. did that go to five games as well? 
Okay, well, that's one of those things where we talk about like close 3-0 games or 3-0 yeah. series or like one-sided 3-2. That was a pretty one-sided 3-2 series. When the Arrows won, they won all their games in like 20 to 30 minutes. It were really stompy and there was only one convincing game from S and the other game, the Arrows came back from a 7K gold deficit. I think that the Arrows still have problems uh, in the mid game, but their early game is one of the best in the world for sure. I mean, they get they get such an advantage early on and a lot of that's due to Kakao's insanely good jungling. So last season, Najin's shield had those two three twos themselves in the round of eight to KT Bullets, then Blaze, and then they went to the final and we look, essentially, I think when we predicted they would win, and a lot of people did, what a lot of us did was we did this logic, kind of what you're saying here. If they play their best, if they play like the games they win in those series, then yeah, they're going to win. They're going to be amazing. But actually, in the finals, didn't go well. They lost, okay. So then it makes you kind of re re collect, re recollect on what you're thinking, okay. Okay, maybe maybe I overrated them because of their good games and I didn't take into account enough their bad games. Have you done that with Katie Arrows, do you think, at all? Have these two series shaken your faith at all? That that in theory no, I mean, I've, been should saying, be I've been saying the whole time that KT Arrows are a very inconsistent team, uh, that they're, they can be the best team or, you know, kind of like a eighth best team in Korea on any given day or in any given game, really. Uh, they haven't really hit their stride in terms of their consistency. Um, so, I, I mean, I think Samsung Blue is going to win the finals 3-1. Uh, that would be my prediction in this scenario. I think KT Heroes will be able to snowball a game. The other thing is that Samsung Blue is very good at overcoming early deficits due to falling behind in laning and still winning a game. So they've got that strength with them too. And uh, that's a style that's very suited to dealing with the KT Heroes. When you are in the position where you described to me a few... Uh, it was a bunch of episodes back, maybe like three or four back. We talked about the Korean teams, and I asked you, okay, no one except SKT ever repeated in OGN. So, you know, there's no way Blue's going to do it, right? And you agreed. You were like, no, I think they probably won't. But then I also asked you, well, who's going to beat them, you know? And you were like, well, yeah, I guess the only one who I think could beat them is White, and you predicted White would beat them, okay. Looking at it now, KT Arrows versus Samsung Blue, it's like an overwhelming, like, what kind of advantage does Blue have here? It must be pretty big, right? Yeah, I think most people would agree it's very significant. When I was doing the True LOL show, though, um, Cloud Templar thinks the KT Arrows are going to win. Uh, he he just thinks that they're going to be like they want it a little more because they if they win, they're going to go up to fourth seed in yeah. Korea in terms of circuit points. Uh, so they'll have to play one fewer best of five, which is going to be uh, you know advantageous, obviously, because that qualifier bracket is so brutal. Um. Yeah. So uh, he feels that the the arrows are going to come, like make the plays, show up, and actually beat blue. I find it difficult to believe that myself, but you never know. Summer finals, like we've had big upsets in the finals before in OGN. So, I mean, to be fair, Cloud Templar also thought Frost would beat Najin Sword in the OGN Winter Final, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> just hey, saying. We don't know what he thought. Yeah, and it's true actually. Maybe he was just like, "Holy shit, we're going to lose." Now I'll just pick totally the wrong champion. Uh, <laughs> no, so actually, let's talk about that semi-final. So we had this semi-final, blue versus white. And what's funny is, I've actually seen a bunch of analysts who've said similar things to what we've said, which is blue, okay, is is the is the best Korean team, but it, there's some, I don't know, even now, Monty, after they've lost, I still watch it and I feel like, yeah, white's going to win this series. Like, something about White just seems like a stronger team, player for player, etc. And, and they're a very good team themselves. And so I, it's almost like I don't understand how Blue is winning. I know they're winning by out-strategizing them, doing, getting the right fights, etc. But I, I still don't understand how White didn't beat them in that semi. What do you think? Uh, well, I think one of the games, White got overconfident with a large lead and didn't close out the game properly. Um, so that was one of the wins. And otherwise, Blue, they're really good at picking scaling team compositions, and their team fighting is incredible. So uh, that's where they really shine, is that they, they have an ability to team fight in a way that is superior to the other Korean teams, and that they're very patient in their play and very methodical in their play. And so... Uh, they can often like bait out a mistake of the enemy team and white is a team too that gets really cocky with lead and 
can play overly aggressive or not play cautiously enough when they have an advantage. And they allowed kind of blue to outscale them by not by not closing properly and making mistakes and getting picked. Do you get any kind of a sense if we put it like that? Part of part of the problem we have, okay, is that if we think about white and blue, we can only think about what they do in the server and as independent teams. Do you think the factor that they're sister teams makes it better for blue? If blue's strength is preparing and scouting an opponent and knowing what to do against that one, does white being their sister team put the advantage to blue there, do you think? Uh, possibly. I don't know how much the coaches overlap there in terms of preparing both teams, so it's a little hard for me to say for sure. Um, but it's also the team kill situation, right? Like, uh, for all we know, just based on the last two seasons, you know, blue is the only team that can beat white, right? Yeah. Maybe they, they just have, like, got them figured out um, in a way that other teams can't. But since we've had these two identical semifinals with these two identical results, uh, it could be just that blue is is the, the kryptonite to white because they are, I think, a little bit smarter and more cautious. And, uh, yeah, I think white actually probably does better in scrims. That's kind of the feeling that I get from uh, listening to the players talk about each other. But when it actually matters, blue is blue is able to pull it out. When we're imagining Blue wins the final and they become not only the second team to win two audience, but they'll also have repeated like SK Telecom did. Does that does that automatically put Blue into like when SK Telecom won two OGNs, okay, they won Worlds as well. We were calling them like the best team ever. Would Blue even be approaching that with two OGNs in a row? I'm sorry, cut out. Would if Blue wins the OGN title, will they be in the conversation for best League of Legends team ever? Uh, yes. I mean, if they win the if they win the OGN title, I think it will depend on how they do at Worlds because we are so close to Worlds that it is a reasonable expectation to have them continue uh, that legacy. But yeah, Samsung Blue has been dominant over the course of uh, this year, and it'll be very interesting to see who is capable of stopping them. I think that they're so smart and they're so safe in their style of play that it's going to be extremely difficult for teams to beat them at Worlds because they, they make very few errors past the laning phase. Okay, in the last few minutes we have, Monty, I feel like I have to ask you some questions about CLG going to Korea because people want to know Ooh. the real talk. Okay, they don't want the bullshit. <laughs> they don't want like some PR thing of like, oh, we did it for this reason, that reason. Loco Doco suggested on Twitter that it was like a desperation move. There's a degree to which, does he have a point there? Was CLG's um, fortunes failing, and so this lining up as an opportunity made sense in a, in kind of like a let's just let's just go all out on this. Well, let me present a, like a different view of this. Um, if we were in a different situation where we weren't going to get top two and actually uh, skip a stage of the playoffs, you know, if we didn't have that shot, so a different situation would be what if we had won every game, uh, right? coming in and we were guaranteed top two, would we still have made this move? And the answer is yes, because it is the best option. Because if even if we were flawless so far in the season and we were guaranteed a top two playoff slot, uh, it still makes more sense for us to come out here to scrim against the Korean teams, to stay together, to practice as a team uh, while Seraph gets his visa, um, and to have in-person coaching. So in that way, it, like it's just the circumstances of either being top two or not being top two. Uh, we didn't feel like it was realistic, especially with a sub player, that we were going to be able to achieve that top two mark. And so why stay in North America at that point? So I, I, I think it's just a, I think it's just a circumstance of where the playoff seeds landed and what was possible. Of course, we we are there were some problems with tilting and stuff like that obviously it wasn't as bad as like chasing the cup made it look cuz it that's like edited reality tv guys uh it's it, it was like there were moments that were that were bad but i don't think that was the pervasive attitude with the team but then again i wasn't around them all the time i can't tell you that that has not happened like i haven't seen any of that kind of behavior since they've been in korea we've been practicing really hard and people seem happy so with the practice situation People were worried, okay, so the gamble is go to Korea, play better teams, then come back and be better for the playoffs. But people were worried, what if the premise doesn't even work? What if they get to Korea and they can't get scrims against OGN level teams? Was that ever even a concern? We, did you know for sure we can definitely get them scrims against whoever, Stealth or Blaze or whoever it is, you know? 
Did you know? I mean, we we know. I mean, I know most of the coaches. I I, I couldn't say I was a hundred percent like a hundred percent sure, but I was like ninety eight percent sure. What was the reaction from the coaches that like they wanted to play? Uh, the react. We've had no problems getting scrims against okay. good teams, and I. You know, that's the thing is like I don't. I don't want to create an unreasonable expectation within the community of, you know, I know the fans are worried about, oh, well, is CLG getting scrims? Are they just scrimming like bad teams? And the answer is no, we're scrimming against a lot of teams, good teams, it's fine. I just don't want to create too much hype. That's why we're not like releasing, because it doesn't matter, guys. You know, really CLG's problems here are that the team like was having like tilt issues that was the core problem i mean we were on, we were in first place for most of the split until like some some attitude and like um kind of focus issues got the better of the team i didn't see it really as major gameplay issues as much as just personal interactions and the team uh, having that kind of synergy and i think the most important thing about coming to korea isn't who we're scrimming against even though we are getting very good practice and we're learning a lot i can tell you um is that it's having the in-house having me there having ziggs here now he just got in this morning so we've got you know two coaches here it's also the fact that they're in a new environment so they have that refresher we're doing everything together meals absolutely everything together as a team except for right now because i'm sitting here on this show instead of like going out to eat with the players um but, you know, and I'm also, I have no champions to do except for two matches while they're here, the third place match in the finals. They're, they're going to be at the finals too. So I, my entire time is being dedicated to being here at the like CLG apartment, working with the team, doing the VOD review. We have a more structured environment. The players are re-motivated to be in solo queue and practice all day. Uh, so it's, I think that was the most important thing is like struct, like new structure, new environment, an ability to manage like the players' attitudes in a way that I just can't remotely, uh, because being you know being halfway across the world is not the most efficient way to coach. I know that's like not a newsflash or anything, um, but I think that that's that's by far the most important aspects of this trip, alongside the fact that we can keep scrimming with Seraph as a whole team, which obviously is what we need to do because it's getting ready for the playoffs. Has watching CLG play directly against OGN level competition at all changed your notion of how Western teams might match up or has it made it seem closer? Does it seem like there's still a long way to go? What What, what is your sense from actually getting to literally see those teams? Because we're not even hypothesizing now. You've seen these teams play each other. Yeah, no, it hasn't changed my opinion at all. There's, there's I'm not gonna say more than that. Yeah, yeah. I, I promise you guys in a few weeks, after playoffs, I can talk about some of these things. I just don't want to right now because that it doesn't matter who we're playing okay. against. It doesn't matter what the results are right now. We are here to like bond as a team, to practice, to make get ready for playoffs, and there is like that just really doesn't matter at all. So, so I have one last question on this topic, which goes like this: If you you've always said actually that the the couple of weeks that you went last split the spring split helped a lot and you got the team back on track and it, even though you didn't have dexter at the time like it fixed a lot of things and you saw like oh if i was there in the house the difference it could make so <laughs> if there have been these problems this split does this make you think by having them over in korea and having them for a week like oh this probably is something we have to do every split like i have to go there or they have to come here we have to ha i have to have some physical time with yeah. the team i can't they can't just be a whole split again where monty's just in korea right yeah, I don't think that's fair to the team or to the fans. So is that something going forward that like you've come to a conclusion on? Oh yeah, I think it. I think it's really necessary. Hmm. Okay, right. I think we pretty much covered everything this week. Any, yeah, any I, I can't. Topic? We we have to. Yeah, we have to scrim in five minutes. So I gotta work on that now. All right. Bye. So it's been fun though.